Bye, lad. Good morning, everybody. Um, I see seven attendees in the waiting room or in the room. Thank you for joining us. You are at the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiencies event. Today, we're going to be talking about climate vulnerability modeling for energy systems. So hopefully you're in the right place. We'll begin promptly at 10 o'clock by my clock, which is in, let's say, about 90 seconds. So please stand by. Good morning, everybody. Once again, it's 10 a.m. and it is time for us to begin. My name is Gerald Lindo. I am from the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. And I want to thank you, first of all, for joining us today for another one in our series of capacity building sessions around integrated resource and resilience planning. Now, what's that all about? Well, at the 82nd meeting of the Council for Trade and Economic Development, that's an organ of CARICOM, CARICOM enjoy, endorsed the methodology, principles and practices of integrated resource and resilience planning as a preferred mechanism for electricity sector planning in the CARICOM member states, the 15 member states in the Caribbean. And CARICOM urged member states to develop integrated resource and resilience plans by 2023. The IRRP methodology requires an appreciation of the technical issues arising from grid expansion with renewable integrate energy integration and also of how you build resilience into such a system. Um, as the CCRE, that's us, the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, works with stakeholders towards delivering integrated resource and resilience plans for countries across the Caribbean, uh, we're producing a series of capacity building sessions that are designed to address critical elements of the IRRP process. These sessions are intended to build institutional capacity for resilient energy planning across the region. And today's session is exactly at the heart of that. Today we're going to be talking about climate vulnerability modeling, particularly as it's applied to energy systems. What are the sorts of climate hazards that one needs to look out for? And how do those affect energy systems performance? Those are some of the key issues that we're going to be looking at today. And to do that, we're joined by a slate of experts. You're going to hear from the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, who will go really deep into some of the climate variables we have to pay attention to. We're also joined by our friends from uh, the NREL, that's the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and also the ICF, who are going to be giving us some case studies around uh, um, climate vulnerability modeling for energy systems and again looking very deep into the energy aspect how is it that um, these climate variables affect an energy system what do you need to look out for and how do you mitigate some of that risk now this session is brought to you uh, thanks to the kind support of the giz that's the the german aid agency but also especially today uh, from our american friends at the United States Agency for International Development. They're working with NREL and ICF to deliver some of this content to you. So at this time, I want to turn over to uh, someone I know for a long time, Eric Conde, who's going to give us a few words of greetings from USAID. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Jerry, and good morning, everyone. Let me just share a couple of slides that I, we've set out to explain better um, the USAID and NREL partnership. So let me present these. Uh, 
Are you able to see my screen? We are. Great, so thanks again, Jerry, and, and everyone for joining. Also, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Ember representatives and ICF, which is providing that technical support. And I wanted to add that uh, on behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, I officially welcome you to this really important webinar on modeling for climate variability, which is key in uh, strengthening the capacities within the Caribbean region for developing integrated resource and resilience planning IRRPs. This level of, of collaboration is pretty close to the center of the Caribbean Energy Initiative, which is USAID latest um, project to support Caribbean region um, in a strengthening the resilience of energy system. And this is based on the critical role that electricity sectors play on, on daily welfare for advancing economic growth in the region and for post-disaster recovery. Um, this project was launched back in 2019 out of the Dominican Republic mission, and this aims to support um, the Caribbean region under USAID scope to advance energy sector reforms, enable economic benefits, and preserve the development of resilience in the face of natural disaster, extreme weather events, and market shocks impacts, which are um, as well important in the region. Uh, at this point, we are designing our implementation mechanisms and um, hopefully later in the year we'll be able to put that out and provide uh, additional support for increasing technical capacities in the region. This session um, is a key element under this IRP webinar series that the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, ENVRIL, has jointly designed with USAID in the coordination uh, of CICRI. And we we appreciate Secret's role uh, throughout this um, layout of the webinar series. Um, this partnership, the Embrel and USA partnership, was created to deliver clean, reliable, and affordable energy to the development world, world and is a great resource uh, to have available to facilitate our work in, in our Caribbean region. How Embrel does this is through a variety of platforms and technical tools, um, as you can see in the slide. And these are made available to overcome critical challenges in the energy sector, such as the lack of sound planning capacities, inclusion of a resilience lens in the design of solutions, and the complexity of determining the feasibility for expanding to newer and cleaner technology for energy generation. Finally, um, I want, I want to recognize and appreciate the time of everyone in joining this session, and I'm sure that we will continue to engage and collaborate to, to advance our national and regional energy goals. And uh, please do keep in mind and continue to use the Resilient Energy Platform, and this is fully available online, and please continue to join um, the upcoming webinars in, in this um, series. So I'm sure we'll have productive discussions and, and a lot of um, state-of-the-art technical uh, guidance for developing our climate vulnerability modeling. So again, thanks to everyone and um, sending it back to you, Jerry. Thank you very much, Eric, and thanks to USAID for continuing supporting these activities. Now let's get underway. Um, as said, today we're going to be talking about climate vulnerability modeling for um, energy systems. Um, before we do, just a logistical note. You'll notice that everybody's microphones um, in the audience are muted. We are expecting many people today, so sorry, but just to keep good order, we're, we've muted all microphones. However, you can still interact with us through the Q&A window. There should be a little button where you can type your questions. Those questions will be moderated. We'll present those questions so everybody can see, and we will make sure we get to every question that you have in, in, in good order. So please use the Q&A if you have any questions or comments, and we'll make sure to recognize you. Um, with that said, let's get on to our first speaker. Our first speaker today 
is knee deep in the world of, of climate and understanding vulnerability. He is Sean Boyce of the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology. That is the CIMH. CIMH gathers and processes all sorts of meteorological data. And that's weather data from across the region. And Sean is quite the master of that. He is the chief hydrologist at the CIMH, so he's a water specialist. Um, he has an MSc in Sustainable Management of the Water Environment and a BSc in Civil Engineering, and he's going to show us quite a bit about how you model vulnerabilities. Uh, Sean, over to you, please. Sean's still with us. Good morning, all. Can you hear me? Hearing you now, Sean. Go ahead. All right, uh, just give me two minutes, please. All right, Sean's sorting out some of his uh, some of his um, technical issues there. Um, so while he does that, um, again, let me encourage you all to use the Q and A section if you have any any questions. You'll have seen that um, that. Um, our moderator Penny is already quite active there. I see Jim Brown for the International Code Council joining us this morning. Thank you for coming, Jim. Um, you know, Mr. Brown, we have your email and I'm going to probably email you later about a completely separate matter. We do some work at um, CCRE around um, efficient buildings and I imagine someone from the ICC would be familiar with the CREBIC, the Caribbean Regional Energy Efficiency Building Code, and might be someone who could work with. Um, let me introduce as well, or just let you give, give you a preview of who else will be speaking today. Um, we'll have presentations from Sherry Stout. Sherry Stout is the Arctic Strategy Program Manager and Senior Research and Engineer, Energy Engineer at the Coal Climate Housing Research Center at NREL. Now it says cold climate, but really Sherry is an expert on island systems, so quite appropriate for what we have to do today. Sherry's primary research focus is on resilient energy transitions at multiple scales of jurisdiction. Um, she's worked on campuses, communities, and also national scale uh, resilience assessments, integrated energy water nexus so analysis and planning, researching the interaction of social science and, uh, sciences and infrastructure resilience. She's built up and or led multiple technical assistance programs and projects at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So she's quite the expert um, on island systems and she'll be telling us a lot today. We also will be hearing from Mason Freed. He's a climate scientist on the ICF's climate adaptation and resilience team. He uses climate projections and remote sensing techniques to characterize uh, risks resulting from climate change and extreme weather and corresponding adaptation strategies for energy efficiency and resilience projects. Uh, Mason's previous professional experience includes investigating climate change impacts and sea level rise at the University of Texas Institute for Geophysics. So between Sean, who's an expert on, on, um, on, on climate, uh, Mason, who's an expert on climate adaptation, and Sherry, who's an expert on energy systems, uh, we think we have a pretty good lineup for you today. I should also mention uh, another one of our moderators today is James Ellworth, Ellsworth, who is a research engineer with NREL. Sean, are you back with us now? I'm here. I'm not sure if you're seeing the presentation, though. Could you verify? Could someone verify what you're seeing? It is up. I'm going to ask Galen to queue it up in the in the display so everyone could see. Yep, there we go. I believe that's it, correct? Or is that just a splash page? That's the first page. Um, All right, so over to you then, Sean. All right, uh, this seems to be a bit of a delay on my end. Um, Uh, okay, um, uh, Gerald? Um, yeah, Paul, Sean. Paul, Paul just crashed, so I have to re reload it. 
Okay, no problem. Let's do that quickly though, and if not, we might move on to another one of the presenters, but let's give Sean just a few minutes to get it started out. Meanwhile, once again, um, please everyone who's in the room, and I see 30 attendees, uh, use the Q&A, let us know where you're from, let us know some of your interests, let us know what questions you have. Um, today we want to cover climate resilience for energy systems, so we're going to be talking about vulnerability assessment and, and, and modeling vulnerability. We're going to talk about the case study that was done in Ghana, and we're also going to talk more generally about how energy systems are affected by climate factors. So please uh, stay engaged and let's keep it rolling. Uh, meanwhile, uh, to fill the time while we sort out some of the technical issues, uh, James, let me turn over to you. I know that we usually do some polling of our audience so we can get a little bit of a better idea of their interests and, um, and inclinations. James? Yes, good morning everybody. Great to be uh, with you all again. Um, we can run some intro polls here just to get a little background on the audience. I'll post a link to that in the chat and I'll show it up on the screen once I get the screen shared here. Uh, so the link is www.polev.com slash lcrow 118. Uh, that should be in the chat and coming up on the screen here in a second once it uh, once it catches up. Yeah, so we like to get a little background on who's in the audience, just so our speakers can know who they're who they're speaking to uh, and what your background is. And so once you go to that link that's in the chat, let's go. Here, we'll just start with a uh, basic breakdown. What countries uh, do we have attendees from here today? And now uh, we've put together a list based on what, uh, based on attendees we've had at these webinars in the past, uh, different Caribbean island nations here. And the link here is on top of the screen too. It's pollev.com slash lcrow 118. And once you get there, we'll see these, uh, we'll see the responses start coming in, I'm sure. Got some representation from Barbados, some from Trinidad and Tobago, from the United States. And if you're from other, if you click other from one of these, uh, there's not a place on poll EV to, to enter what that is, but you can go over to the uh, Teams live meeting and type in what other country you're from so we get an idea. And again, if you're just joining, the link to uh, to this polling site is in the Q&A of the Teams live meeting. All right, so a good breakdown here. Trinidad and Tobago, especially where I presented some DR coming in too. And all right. So hopefully everyone's gotten over here and entered your answers. We'll move on to the next question. Get another five seconds for responses to come in. One last minute, and two on Barbuda. Okay, so next question, what type of agency or organization do you represent? So are you here from a utility, regulator, energy agency, environmental group, USAID or other? And if you're from other, again, looks like there's plenty of people whose groups aren't represented here. Please enter that in the chat on the MS Teams meeting so we can get a sense of who's here and maybe change this breakdown of represented organizations or agencies in the future. But it looks like a good split, some, several others, and a lot of utility representatives. All right, and then we'll go to one final question here uh, before we get going in the presentations, uh, just to see how you um, 
see how you're feeling about going into this webinar. Rank the following in order of importance uh, for power sector generation. So totally in your opinion. I'm sure there'll be some tough decisions here as a lot of you think all of these things are important. But is it uh, clean or renewable energy sources? Cheapest upfront cost, lowest lifetime cost. Um, predictable power generation. I'm going to try to get it back on the screen here. Yeah, so ranking these in order of importance. So if you go on to the poll EV, you can choose which order of these things you think is most important. So cleaner renewable energy sources, cheap upfront cost, a lowest lifetime cost, predictable power generation. Um, see energy independence, getting your energy from a domestic source rather than an, uh, an imported source. Whatever we've been to, flexibility or uh, resilience, the ability to provide power specifically after a severe weather event or another threat here. So I think I got all of those as they bounce around on my screen here. But what are your priorities for, for your energy generation? Nice to see a lot of prioritization of clean and renewable energy sources and resilience as well. That's a big topic of this of this session. And we'll just let this go for a while. It might take might take people a little while to get their priorities or figure out their order. We'll give this another 10 seconds. But good to see that our audience is so have clean and renewable energy sources, resilience, energy independence, less reliance on imports. And then the cost considerations coming in last, which is interesting. Might uh, speak to who we have on, on the line here. Give it another five seconds, but otherwise, um, I think is, uh, is Sean ready to go here? I think I saw his presentation pop up, so I want to say he is. Sean, how are we doing? Hi, um, Gary, Gerald, sorry. Um, every little I'm ready to go. Hopefully, it runs smoothly. All right, Galen, queue him up. Once again, everybody, Sean Boyce of the CIMH. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. Apologies for the, the delay. Um, nevertheless, we'll try to, to get through as quickly as possible. As was pointed out by the moderator, my name is Sean Boyce. I'm actually the chief hydrologist here at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology, um, where we um, are supporting this IRRP process and the way to deliver and support this capacity building session. Just a little bit about CIMH. I, I believe that there are some persons here on the call that may not necessarily be familiar with the Institute. Uh, we are located in Barbados. Uh, we have 16 member countries across the Caribbean. Uh, we are a CARICOM institution um, and our main roles are yeah. listed on the screen. Um, I'm getting a message saying I need to share my screen again. I don't know why. Uh, let me try to see if I can, if I can accommodate that. I assume everything fine and good. Yeah, well, we're good now. OK, um, I guess. I mean, I, I'm not sure if the, the, the Mac and the, and the Windows application are playing it all together, but you know, we're going on the best. Uh, so very quickly, um, just a bit about CIMH. Yeah, we are a World Meteorological Organization Regional Training Centre, um, and a centre for research, meteorology and hydrology and climatology, um, a regional data centre, and so on and so forth. We're presented with a list um, of our functions, and I won't necessarily go through them one by one. Suffice to say that we have um, 
experience related to both meteorology, climatology, and of course, hydrological applications as well here at the Institute. Uh, for more information, you can visit our website. I believe the information should be on the last slide. So today's presentation is broken down into four parts. Um, I know there tends to be some, um, I guess, misinformation if you want to use that term as it relates to some of the definitions and concepts related to vulnerability risk and so on. So we went through those, um, we talk a bit about climate risk, we look at um, very briefly at risk assessment methodology, and then introduce um, a couple of applications that we use here at CAMH to assess risk. All right, so definitions and concepts so that everyone is on the same page when we speak about these terms. So according to UNDRR, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, a hazard is a process, phenomenon, or human activity that may cause loss of life, injury, or other health impact, property damage, social and economic disruption, or environmental degradation. Hazard may be natural, anthropogenic or socio-natural in origin, and they are, are characterized by the location, intensity, magnitude, frequency, and probability. So in the case of climate-related hazards, you're really talking about socio-natural hazards. There's a, a combination of both natural and anthropogenic um, hazards. Exposure. So this is a term that's commonly used. What does it mean? Well, the situation of people, infrastructure, housing, production capacities, and other tangible human assets located in hazard prone areas. So essentially, once you have an idea of the hazard footprint, let's say, any people, uh, critical infrastructure, and so on and so forth, would be used to define your exposure. It can include people, or right, can you include actual physical assets or a combination of both all the things of how you're looking at your vulnerability? So that moves us on to the actual definition for vulnerability. Well, the conditions determined by physical, social, economic, and environmental factors are processes which increase the susceptibility of an individual, a community, assets, our system to the impact of hazards. So it's a very broad definition here for vulnerability, but essentially, um, to put it, I guess, in, in more common terms, essentially, once you have an idea of your hazard footprint, you have defined your exposures, then the vulnerability is, is more or less a combination of the hazard and exposure. However, there's one important um, thing you need to remember, and that is capacity or the coping capacity or an ability to, to, to cope, for example. So to really get at what your vulnerabilities may be, uh, we need to consider the fact that uh, you can um, maybe modify um, some workflow or make some adjustment in some um, modification to, to a, a plant or distribution system to increase your capacity or improve your capacity, enhance your capacity, which would um, reduce vulnerabilities. What do I mean by capacity? Um, well, generally, you're talking about strength, attributes, resources that may be available within any organization, community or society, to manage the actual disaster risk and strengthen resilience. And then by extension, when we speak of coping capacity, the actual ability of, of persons to utilize skills and resources to manage adverse conditions due to risk or disasters for example. So when you're speaking about vulnerability or whether an area or asset is vulnerable or even a population is vulnerable, you need to also consider the, their coping capacity. So that leaves us with the definition of risk. Well, risk really kind of brings together the concept of the concept of hazard, vulnerability and exposure, uh, just broadly speaking. Um, is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Uh, by effects, this can be positive, uh, negative, or it can be both. Uh, however, in the case of 
Uh, I guess generally in the case of climate vulnerability, it's probably talking about negative assets. However, one may re recognize when you go through the risk um, assessment procedure that there may be some benefits along the line somewhere in some cases. So risks are not always negative. Um, it's usually expressed in terms of sources, potential events, their consequences and their likelihood. What does this mean? Well, there's an aspect of probability within the whole concept of risk, which needs to be uh, considered when defining risk. So you'll find that usually persons tend to use the, the terms risk and vulnerability interchangeably. However, they are very strict definitions for these things. So I just thought I would start by providing some of the definitions and, and concepts so everyone's on the same page when we speak about risk, vulnerability, exposure and hazards. Um, so essential risk is a function of hazard and vulnerability, as you will have seen based on previous slides. And uh, it is proportional directly to the hazard and exposure and inversely proportional to the coping capacity. So when we speak of vulnerability, vulnerability is really a function of the exposure and the coping capacity. Climate. Um, climate describes the average weather conditions for a particular location over a long period of time. Not to be mistaken with weather, which describes the short term conditions of the atmosphere. So in layman's term, climate is what you expect to get, weather is what you actually get. So we move, if we um, expand our definition of climate a bit more, you also have to consider the varying time scales when you speak about weather and climate. Uh, so for example, when we speak of weather, we're talking about forecasts or observations that may be um, happening now in terms of no casting or forecasts that may be hours, days, in some cases weeks into the future. So that time scale is known as the weather time scale. When we speak of climate variability, we're moving up the time scale ladder, so to speak, into um, time scales ranging from months, seasons, to years. And when we speak of climate change, we're talking about decadal change and changes over centuries. As you notice, as you move from weather through, through climate variability to climate change, the forecast uncertainty grows. Therefore, when we, we look at climate change projections, you also need to always consider the fact that you have a rather large uncertainty uh, and try to apply the information as best you can, given those um, uncertainties. In terms of the region, how it's kind of structured and who does what, so to speak, your National Meteorological and Hydrological Service, in um, collaboration with CAMH in some ways, uh, we do a lot of work in the weather time scale as well as the climate variability time scale uh, through, in part, the Caribbean Climate Outlook Forum, which is headed by a colleague here at CAMH. Through that forum, climate variability products and weather products are produced to support decision making, not only within um, the energy sector, but also to support other sectors along the way. And I'm not sure if anyone on the call is familiar with CARICOF, but it's a, a very useful forum for, to support decision making across sectors. Uh, our colleagues in Mona, CSGM, Climate Studies Group Mona, located at the University of West Indies Mona campus, uh, they kind of focus more on the climate change realm. However, there is some overlap, obviously, between all the time scales, and we try to support um, the region through the provision of products and services, many of which will be of use to the energy sector. So just to summarize, when we talk about weather forecast, we're talking about the weather time scale. When we speak about climate for seasonal climate forecast, sorry, we're talking about the same variability, same scale. And when we speak of climate change projections, we're talking about the climate change um, time scale. So what I did um, to get a formal definition for our climate vulnerability, so we have the definition of our vulnerability that I presented in a previous slide. It's essentially I provide a, a definition that considers climate rather than just hazards. So we can say for our climate vulnerability, the conditions determined by physical, social, economic, and environmental factors or processes, which increase the susceptibility of an individual, a community, assets, or systems to the impact of climate variability and or climate change. And 
as we know, climate variability and our climate change also has an impact on weather patterns. So I could have included the weather here as well. All right, so um, climate risk and the energy sector. So <clears throat> related to the actual energy sector, the way we can um, conceptualize risk is in three different categories. Uh, risk related to generation, risk related to transmission and distribution, risk related to demand. So we're going to delve a bit more into these three categories. So I'm not sure how many people on the call, how many persons um, generally are familiar with the State of the Caribbean Climate Report that was produced by the Climate Studies Group MONA in cooperation with CIMH and some other institutions in the Caribbean. However, it's a good resource for information related to climate expectations, climate protections, climate services within the Caribbean. So I kind of took some excerpts from it um, to show how information relates to uh, the defining risk and so on, uh, climate related risk, sorry, in the energy sector. So in terms of hydropower potential, for example, what we can expect due to climate change uh, based on information in the report is that the number of consecutive dry days is increasing. So this is something that we've seen already, as well as the amount of rainfall during rainfall events. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, if you have um, more intense rainfall, that means you're more, like, more likely to get more runoff, limited amount of, of water actually may reach um, aquifers and in some cases river systems. Uh, with a certain increase in the number of consecutive dry days, then you're essentially looking at a drier future. Which means that um, one could expect um, in the Caribbean as a whole, a gradually dry draining through the end of the century. There are some differences based on where you are in the Caribbean, based on the, the modeling effort that was done. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, suffice to say that drier conditions will impact hydropower potential and the availability of water for cooling and the future climate scenario. Solar potential, again, from Taking up on the report, what we're seeing is an increase in temperature in, in the Caribbean and it is consistent with the global warming trend. So you could expect at the Caribbean as a whole to gradually warm to the end of the century, where you have increases in minimum, maximum, and mean temperatures um, throughout the end of the century. And this is irrespective of the, the various um, emission scenarios. So what does this mean? Increased air temperature, for example, will obviously lower solar PV efficiency in addition to energy output. Rare conditions will also increase the number of dust events that one may have, the dust incursions across the Caribbean, some of which um, we would have seen um, last year, which led to some, some impacts on the, the, the um, PV efficiency. Uh, so these types of events is likely to to be um, happening more often, which obviously will have an impact on your um, full potential moving forward. So in terms of some of the, the work that CM has started to, to, to get involved in, um, I believe we have a couple of studies on it uh, related to um, renewable energy production and modeling. So we have on campus um, several uh, PV installations. And given that we also have the capacity to do some modeling and monitor variables and so on, we've been looking at things like, for example, the impact of um, temperatures on PV potential. This is more within the, the weather time scale. Uh, also, we are looking at the impact of Thus, 
on the performance of the PV panels as well. So within that that better time scale, if you like, this, this is more towards supporting things like, for example, um, the balance of the grid. Um, so once this research is further matured, then we could start to look at applications that perhaps can you can be used to support um, the integration of renewables into um, various energy production systems, uh, where one can balance the grid based on the irradiance uh, being received, for example. Um, risk related to generation again. So we're talking about wind potential in this case. Um, what are we seeing? Uh, well, this kind of repeats from the previous slide, increasing in temperature in, in the Caribbean is consistent with global warming trends. Okay, we know the Caribbean is gradually getting warmer. But in terms of wind potential, what does this mean? Well, the changes in wind climatology due to increased air temperatures um, lowers wind potential. So in support of, of this, um, we have uh, a member of staff who recently completed a, a PhD who looked at this whole issue of um, future wind potential. Um, so he would have conducted a study um, maybe two years ago or so um, for, as part of his dissertation, where he categorized the Caribbean into three zones and looked at the uh, wind resource potential for each zone. So first, he would have looked at some observational data. In this case, 1949 to 2015, he would also included some reanalysis data from um, climate sources to get a sense of the climatology for that um, baseline period. And using that information, he was able to project for various scenarios um, the future um, wind resource potential generally for the Caribbean. Um, and what the research showed is that um, for both scenarios, uh, increasing winds for the period shown uh, sulfur through the Guianas, um, also for the CLLJ, I'm not sure if I highlighted it, but CLLJ is the Southwest Caribbean. We are expecting um, decreasing winds so too in the Western Caribbean. Uh, so, I mean, there's still some work to be done here. Obviously, at this scale, um, perhaps it may not necessarily be, um, well, let me put it another way, perhaps the scale isn't most applicable for site, site assessments, but it is a start. However, the next step obviously would be to refine the work and make it uh, a bit more site specific, which would require higher resolution models. And we're actually at the point where we're looking to start some of this type of modeling at uh, higher resolution um, this year in, co in collaboration with CSGN. All right, so risk related to generation. Um, so you're talking about infrastructure, the actual plants and so on. Um, so in the, what, what we have seen is a significant increase in frequency and duration of Atlantic hurricanes since 1995. Uh, there's a shift toward stronger storms by the end of the century, measured by maximum wind speed increases. So what they're saying here is that by stronger storms, you're only considering the wind speed, not necessarily the rainfall, for example. However, as it relates to rainfall, 20% to 30% increase in rainfall rates um, based on the, the model hurricane, hurricanes in a core. So it's more intense storms and extreme precipitation events, you could expect more damages to generation infrastructure, especially along the, the coastlines, which tend to be exposed to um, storm surge and other coastal inundation processes. And as many of you know, a lot of the power infrastructure, especially plants, um, is located along vulnerable coastlines. Uh, risk related to transmission and distribution. We know that increased temperatures reduce efficiency. We know that more intense storms, severe convection and coastal inundation, which may or may not be related to sea level rise, 
can be expected to damage transmission and distribution infrastructure. And, then, and in a drier climate, one would, could expect reasonably to assume that there will be an increase in welfare activity, which obviously can directly damage transmission and distribution infrastructure. So I would encourage you to um, read the, the State of the Caribbean Claim Report. I believe it's available on the website of the Caribbean Development Bank, but it does have some rich information in there, and um, obviously more than I can present in this short period of time. Uh, some things that we've seen already uh, in 2015, the what well, I guess was infamously known as the Christmas Eve trough. Uh, we were seeing direct evidence of impacts to hydroelectric um, insulation. So in an area called Cumberland, there is a hydroelectric insulation right in um, right adjacent to a river system. And during the event, um, the river went into flood and damaged the actual, some of the equipment within the substation. The image on the right shows you where the water level came um, during the event itself. So when it comes to things like placing some of these um, type of um, installations close to rivers, we need to be mindful of um, what is expected to happen, not even now, but what can happen in the future. Because obviously under changing climate, one may expect such events to happen more, more uh, regularly, or perhaps the intensity may be, may be a bit higher. Similarly, if one look at what happened in September 2017 due to the passage of Hurricane Maria um, in Dominica, they have these larger centralized systems um, with overhead and the ground lines, which were obviously very, very badly impacted by the uh, passage of Hurricane Maria, not, all, all, not only due to the wind, the wind speed and wind intensity, but also the debris that the wind would carry um, and also cause uh, destruction. So risk related demand. Um, two things to note without going into too much detail, increased temperatures will increase the energy demand for cooling and may stress uh, capacity limits if not carefully planned for. Uh, decreased precipitation and increasing dry days will increase irrigation as well as possible water demand, which has an energy component. For example, if there's need to expand water distribution to include um, desalination plant, for example, that has an energy um, input that needs to be considered. And if you're looking to expand into that area as a, as a uh, I guess, as a, generally as a, a water resource agency, then you need to consider the impact on energy and whether that energy is actually available at the scale required. And similarly, if you're concerned about increasing dry days and the impact on agriculture, then one would have to look at the possibility of providing um, these various irrigation schemes, but also would have an energy component to them that needs to be considered. All right, so moving on to risk assessment. What is risk assessment? Well, the risk assessment is a combination of risk identification, risk analysis, and risk evaluation. So what does risk identification try to capture? Well, risk identification aims to describe risk that may help or prevent objectives from being achieved. Remember, I would have noted at the beginning that risks are not always negative. In some cases, they can be. In some cases, risk can be positive. However, in the context of what we've been discussing, you can identify or you can imagine risk identification as that same process we looked at uh, earlier of trying to figure out the impact on generation, transmission and distribution, and demand. So that's kind of how you would identify your risk by going through um, these various categories and based on your particular scenario in your particular country and you have particular um, specific I should say, um, actions that maybe may need to be taken to identify risk based on your, your environment. The risk analysis, this is kind of where I guess most of the number crunching is done. 
the risk analysis aim to understand the nature and level of risk. Sorry, please typo. It considers uncertainties, sources, likelihood and capacity, and so on. What is that saying? Well, um, when it comes to risk analysis procedures, there are probabilistic components where one may look at um, return periods. A return period is, is more or less a probability of what you may expect to happen or occur in the future. And if you're considering, for example, um, a flood hazard or a wind hazard, those types, those types of information can be reported based on a return period, which, as I said, is a probability. And having an idea of that probability, one can develop um, various vulnerability um, functions that consider the various probabilities of those, those different types of hazards. The vulnerability, as we know, considers the exposure and the ability to, to cope. Also, vulnerability can be expressed in terms of damage. So the last point here, or last bullet point on the slide says analysis techniques can be qualitative, quantitative, or a combination of both. So, in qualitative terms, we're not generally trying to find um, a, a value uh, to determine your risk in terms of a, a dollar figure, let's say. Whereas for a quantitative analysis, you're looking at trying to quantify the actual risk in, in dollar value terms. So vulnerability can also be expressed in terms of damage. And um, damage, you can put a, a cost to. So you may have heard persons talking about damage curves, for example, when it comes to risk analysis. So a damage curve is similar to what you, you're seeing here. In this case, the, the image is showing a vulnerability curve, but it could even easily be expressed as a damage curve, providing you know the expected damage based on the intensity of the hazard being modeled. And having that information, one can compute a cost, a damage cost and collate that information um, over all the various assets to get a um, quantitative information or on risk. The last step in risk assessment is risk evaluation. So this is where after you finish your analysis, you want to make a decision. The evaluation aims to support the decision making process. Uh, one will have some defined risk criteria, uh, example of which is shown on the right. Uh, in this case, it was a, a risk criteria developed for severe convection for application at the weather time scale. Um, but one could develop similar type uh, risk criteria type products, which essentially enable you to determine not only the impact, but also the response to the actual impact. Um, so that persons who may be exposed would have information or assets that may be exposed, you can um, define how you're going to um, transfer that risk or accept the risk or whether you need to try to implement some type of coping mechanism given the level of risk exposure. So I think I believe I have two more slides. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. Um, in terms of risk assessment applications at CMH. Um, go ahead, Gerald. You're, you're good for time so far, Sean. Um, when you do those two, let's take a bit of a pause and, and take a few questions. Right, so I have two more slides, so we can take the questions after, if you don't mind. Good to go. All right, thank you. All right, so. Risk assessment applications um, here at CAMH. Um, I mean, this application in itself would be a whole other presentation. Obviously, we don't have time for that, but just to give a, a flavor of what we're doing here. Um, the Caribbean Director platform is essentially our impact based forecasting system. It's kind of more focused in the in the weather and climate weather sorry time scale, but we are now expanding to include um, climate related information. But essentially, what the platform does it brings together your hazard data. It brings together your exposure data, whether it be 
Um, people centric or, or asset centric and also have decision making tools included similar to what you would have seen on the risk evaluation slide. The idea is really to bring together information into a JS environment, so it's an online JS platform that we use to support impact based forecasting. Essentially, all impact, impact based forecast is, is a, a risk based forecast in some of this. Um, so I'll give a quick example of the type of information that may be there. Inside the platform, you have your weather prediction products, you have station observations, um, hybrid maps, and so on and so forth, which enable you qualitatively to have an idea of the risk. So this is an example of a qualitative risk assessment um, tool where you're not actually quantifying the risk, but you have a general idea of where the risk may be and the level of um, exposure and expected impact. So when compared to another tool, this one is a, a slightly different platform that is more geared towards quantitative risk assessment, where given some type of flood scenario, you have information on the damage that may be related to that particular hazard scenario, and you collect information across all the assets, which could include obviously um, power grid assets. And once you have the expected damage based on the hazard, you can collect, collect that information into an actual damage figure. I'm not sure if it's quite clear in terms of the diagram, but essentially what it's showing is a breakdown of the damage across various sectors and assets given a certain um, probabilistic uh, interpretation of a hazard, in this case, flood. So very quickly, that is a, a very, in a nutshell, a way of, of looking at qualitative risk assessment through these various types of tools that are out there. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm open for any questions that you may have at this time. Thanks for giving the opportunity to present on this important topic. I look forward to working through this IRRP process in the future. Over to you, Daryl. Thanks a lot, Sean. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, I have several myself, but thank you very much for a detailed and very interesting presentation. The, one of the first comments that we got while you were talking, I thought was a very interesting discussion point. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think it's one that that, that really could spark discussion. An anonymous person said, based on this statement, when you were talking about um, the effects of, of rainfall changes on hydro, based on this statement, then hydro should not be considered as a way forward in generation production. Um, how would you respond to that? All right, um, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, you have to bear in mind that, uh, I mean, generally speaking, one could expect to have a um, reduction in, in rainfall activity um, in some locations. However, you must bear in mind that um, you can also have, as it was stated, increasing runoff. So there's not, there are ways in which you can um, the ways in which you can consider um, still expanding your renewables to include um, things like hydropower potential, especially considering that, I mean, as I know, as a hydrologist, what you actually know is that there isn't really sufficient data currently being collected to really give a, a firm assessment of currently the amount of water resources available. So I think uh, before making such a statement, one needs to be, um, we all need to put more things in place to assess the current resource before we can actually look at what may happen in the future. Um, yes, we're talking about coming into a, a, a drier climate, but they always the ability to adapt what you're doing. Remember that you can always reduce your vulnerability by increasing capacity, your coping capacity. So it's not to say that because it's getting drier means that it's not a, a, a uh, a valid um, source of renewable energy. You just need to make sure that you have the proper things in place, given in mind that it's possible that you may have um, on, in some areas uh, a reduction in, in water, but who's to say other areas don't have an increase? So it all requires uh, a bit more planning to make such a decision. Um, but I guess Daryl may want to respond to that. No, I agree with everything you said, Sean. And, and I, what, one thing I'd add is that you know, 
I think you made the point very strongly that what you have to do is collect data and plan for the things that may happen. That's different from saying straight off the bat that you're writing off a particular energy source. You know what I mean? Rather than say that, boy, hydro should not be considered, you say hydro is going to have certain risks and I need to consider those risks if I'm going to be implementing hydro. And you could have many other reasons that you do want to implement hydro, right? It could be that a country has a goal for um, going 100% renewable energy and therefore hydro has to be a part of that. You're not going to turn away from your goals because there are some risks involved. Rather, you're going to think about the risks and you're going to think about how to get around those and how to plan for them. As, as you said, Sean, collect the data so you can have a good basis for that planning. I have another question for Sean. Uh, given the uncertainties Sean spoke about for climate change projections, are there risks in relying on these uncertain projections for decision making? How do you respond to that one, Sean? SME, I mean, this whole idea of um, of managing risk is very broad. So you, the, the various risks that you have to manage, you know that the climate um, model, especially when you when you go into the, say 2100, there is some considerable uncertainty there. But I guess the question is, uh, what do you do now? Because you have you have made a decision. So essentially, you have to weigh the risk of doing something now against not doing something now. Even though we are set that there is some uncertainty, we still have to make a decision moving forward. Um, we will never have a claim model that will tell us exactly what's going to happen in 2100. Uh, we have an idea of what we can expect given um, some reasonable set of um, information. So it all comes back down to managing risk. Um, at the end of the day, um, you want to be able to um, manage the risk as best as possible and implement systems that have the equipment capacity required. Um, but just to go back to the, the first question, let's make a point. The idea is not to have one source of renewable energy. We're talking about integrating different um, assets. So uh, just remember that at the end of the day, you're not depending on one um, potential source of energy as far as I'm concerned. Over. Agreed. Agreed. As I said, risk management. Um, another question here, and I want to pose it to you, Sean, but I might also pose it to 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 Sherry as well, uh, not to get ahead of her presentation, but given the projected increase in temperatures and possible increase in the number of days of low irradiance from dust events, how will islands that are putting in large solar PV capacities on their grid maintain resilience in the future? Let me start with uh, Let's start with Sean and then go to Sherry for that one. All right, so uh, I mean, starting to get in some energy questions. This may be ultimately ballpark, but I mean, I can speak generally. Um, <laughs> in terms of, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of work to be done now to understand the impact of dust incursions on solar uh, PV potential, as well as the impact of temperatures and so on. So I think if we start looking at no, in terms of what's happening no, no casting type tools and so on, then we'll be in a better position to try to figure out what may happen um, in the future. So I think that, I think that for me is, it's a better understand what's happening now. I think that, that work still needs to, to mature a bit as far as I know. Uh, but I guess I agree I, with I could, I could be by any time. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and the last couple of slides you had really showed some of the tools that CIMH has um for and, and and you spoke also about data collection that is the start right you collect the data you use these tools and you assess um what your options might be sherry what's your take on this yeah thanks uh thanks sherry and, and sean that was a fantastic presentation one of the better ones i've ever seen in explaining climate risks in an understandable way so um you know predicting those climate change risks are, are really challenging I actually think, you know, yeah, the increasing temperatures are going to reduce the efficiency of solar. That's how solar works. Um, however, there are some some other things to consider. For example, um, as Sean mentioned, the hydro resources may be reduced. You know, one way to um, to deal with evaporation is actually to put solar panels on top of those hydro resources where you do have a reservoir. And that does two things. It reduces evaporation related to the hydro. It also cools the panels. 
And so you can kind of solve two issues with one solution um, in doing that type of technology deployment. The other issue, um, not really related to the heat, but as Sean mentioned, you know, increasing winds, that's going to be a big issue. You know, how designing your solar arrays to, to withstand those increasing winds is actually going to be probably a bigger issue. And, and we'll talk about this in our presentation is actually probably going to be a bigger issue in maintaining a resilient system than the heat, at least on, on the surface. You know, the demand and, and the production is going to vary more with the heat. But in terms of major events, you can definitely lose solar if you don't have it rated for the wind loading that it's actually going to experience. Um, and so as you look toward those future projections, like what Sean presented, you need to plan for those 20 to 30 percent increases in wind, not just the wind you're seeing today. Yeah, very good point. I mean, we in the Caribbean are very familiar with storms and, you know, we're just going to have to prepare for more of those and understanding what our exposure is, is going to be critical. Um, let me thank Sean again for, again, excellent presentation. I would encourage everyone in the audience, particularly those last couple of slides that you saw from Sean, where he was talking about some of these tools that are available. Um, they're available. Talk to us or talk to CIMH to, to see how these tools may be applicable for your work in terms of managing your risk to, to climate. At this time, I want us to switch over to uh, I think we're going to have Mason from ICF up next and uh, I, I introduced him a little bit before, but just to do it one more time, uh, let me just jump to my script here. Uh, Mason Freed is a climate scientist on ICF's climate adaptation and resilience team. He uses climate projections and remote sensing techniques to characterize risks resulting from climate change and extreme weather and corresponding adaptation strategies for energy efficiency and resilience projects. Mason's previous professional experience includes investigating climate change impacts and sea level rise at the University of Texas Institute for Geophysics. And I believe today he's going to talk to us about a case study that was located in, I want to say, Ghana. Is that correct, Mason? Yes, can everyone hear me? Hearing you loud and clear. Excellent, yep. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction. Um, can everyone see my screen that I'm sharing? I got a false. Yeah, we can see it. Just need to enter presentation mode or whatever. Yeah. Great, great. There we go. Excellent. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity um, to talk today. Um, this uh, presentation is going to be on a case study of a climate resilience assessment of mini grids in um, Ghana. I think this is a nice opportunity to build on the really great um, talk that Sean just gave, and you know, this this will just give some. Um, sort of practical examples of the types of um, themes and assessment and data processing that Sean was speaking to. So we'll we'll go through that and um, have uh, an opportunity for questions at the end. Now, um, I'd just like to start and say that you know I think most of us have an idea of what um, you know mini grids are. Um, it's a great opportunity for. Uh, a renewable energy solution. Um, they can draw on power generation from solar, wind, um, you know, biofuels, etc. Um, they can either be connected to the main grid um, or they could be islanded and serve, you know, rural communities along the last mile. So they're um, a really great um, option. Um, in that they're they're flexible um, and and clean, but just like the main grid, um, you know, mini grids uh, face climate risks, right? Um, and so you know some of the same themes and and risks that we think of, you know, in broader terms that um, you know are also certainly apply um, to mini grids. So. Our um, this this study that um, we conducted um, was with a collaborative team of experts on behalf of USAID. Um, 
led by Dr. Molly Helmuth, which is who is my colleague um, at ICF. Um, and we had uh, we worked with a number of folks um, on the ground in Ghana. I'll, I'll say a bit, bit more about them and, and where we were in a second. Um, but we had a, you know a range of expertise, you know both you know climate science, but also you know real applied um, renewable energy specialists and um, uh, and definitely uh, local knowledge as well. Now um, this study. Uh, again, uh, through USAID and um, on behalf of the IRRP, was a climate resilience assessment to do three things um, for a suite of mini grid uh, systems in Ghana. One was to first identify the current and potential future climate change and associated risks um, for the mini grid, uh, this mini grid pilot program in Ghana. And as Sean said, you know, there's climate risks are on some sort of continuum from the near term weather to long term climate. This was certainly focused more on long term climate, but also appreciated that many of those long term or, you know, risks are already happening um, in, in present day. Um, second thing was to assess uh, the extent to which climate change was considered in the planning and design and construction of these mini grids, you know, to what degree was resilience. Um, uh, part of the planning process and then finally use the, the above information to think about how to identify uh, measures for building uh, more resilience to these existing mini grids um, against climate risks. Um, just I just want to provide some local context uh, for this project. Um, so Ghana has one of the highest electrification rates in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they have uh, a sustainable energy for all goal um, where they want to um, provide electricity for everyone by a certain year in the future, which I don't have here. It's been a couple of years. I think it's 2030. Um, um, but um, the, the more important part is that, you know, to meet that goal, roughly 2 million people living are, are currently living in rural remote areas that the national grid is uh, more unlikely to reach in the next 10 years to meet this goal. And so mini grids present a great solution um, for these uh, community electrification in these communities. Um, and so the, the government um, plans to install um, 300 new renewable energy mini grid systems by 2030 uh, to serve um, small communities. In support of that goal, um, the Energy Development and Access Project, um, along with World Bank and others, established a mini grid pilot program uh, to electrify five communities um, in the Lake Volta Islands and the Volta River Delta. So Lake Volta is one of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive lake. Um, it is dammed, it's you know, a, a reservoir um, technically, um, but you can see it here in the map um, on the right. There's this uh, blow up in A. This is sort of these island communities. There's four island communities in Lake Volta um, that where the, the mini grids were installed. And this, this lake drains out into a river towards um, the Gulf of Guinea. Um, and that is uh, the Volta River Delta where a fifth site was. And so those pink dots and those, those little maps they just show these, these communities that were part of the mini grid pilot program. Um, these are mainly solar mini grids. So they, they, they have solar PV. The one um, um, site along the coast in the, in the, in the Delta also has a wind uh, turbine. Um, installed capacities between 30 and um, 55. Uh, kilowatts and you know they have battery storage right and um, I think all of these sites also had backup uh, diesel uh, generators uh, to get through periods where uh, renewable energy production or generation was um, low. You know I think you know we're I'm amongst uh, you know um, Friends here today, so I think you know we have some ideas of 
the many benefits of um, renewable energy and, and, and mini grids, um, you know, they're numerous. Low, they're obviously a low emission solution for energy resilience. Um, they have great benefits for the communities they serve. Um, um, you know, ranging from security and health uh, to education and um, honestly, uh, you know, the mini grids here, you know, just provide provided a nice even outlet for the community to just uh, hang around and, um, you know, as a, as a meeting place. But more importantly, I think for our discussion today is that those benefits can't be realized without um, without um, a lens to uh, resilience. So um, first, I just want to highlight that these mini grids, even this pilot program in Ghana um, was already has already experienced um, risks uh, from climate hazards and so um, that are affecting the performance and lifespan of these systems. So um, Sean has already touched on, you know, um, many of these, uh, but, you know, um, feedback from stakeholders and community members underscored things like, you know, rising temperatures. There's unanimous observation that um, there's steadily increasing temperatures at all sites. Um, you know, severe weather. Um, there's a period, sort of the Easter period um, of high winds. The Harmattan winds that come off the of Sahara, really dry, dusty winds. There's also a wet season. Both of these can disrupt power lines, um, warp, um, you know, acid materials. This is, you know, these communities are, well, four of them, um, the mini grid sites are island communities. And so there's lake flooding um, and high water levels during the rainy season can flood those um, sites to a varying degree. We'll look at that in a sec. Sea level rise along the coast, obviously the backup diesel generator, you know, that's turned on when when needed and it's um, expensive and um, not the most convenient thing. So, you know, the resilience benefits that we saw on the previous slide are only as strong as the resilience of the mini grids themselves. And so um, what we went um, to do is, is, is help um, put together a resilience assessment for these five pilot sites. Um, that uh, would do a few things. One is identification of the relevant um, climate hazards. Um, we wanted to do, you know, quantify those hazards. So we acquired and uh, generated data and did some data analytics um, to give colors to those climate hazards. Um, assessment, you know, then present and future climate and weather driven risks to the mini grid systems. We actually use that data to come to some um, uh, conclusion of risk. Uh, and then finally, that allowed us to identify, help identify um, some climate resilient strategies. And throughout, you know, these process, these these steps, there was heavy community engagement, um, seeing, you know, um, you know what the historical precedent was for some of these risks, and um, that also helped us uh, gauge what could be done uh, to mitigate those risks in the future. Um, so this is um, not totally unlike what we saw two slides ago, but I just want to underscore that um, you know, the first thing we'll, we'll kind of go into a few more detailed slides right here. But you know, the first step is this identification of climate hazards and risks. Um, some themes that come up, um, and again that Sean uh, spoke to earlier, is that uh, you know increasing temperatures. Um, can reduce um, the efficiency of certain components of these mini grid systems. Um, so battery banks um, can lower the capacity of distribution lines, can lower solar PV output um, and wind turbine output. Obviously, extreme storms and high winds have direct um, you know, physical impacts on distribution lines, other infrastructure. Um, dust, as we were just talking about, um, it plays a big role in solar, you know, controlling or lowering solar PV output, those dry winds from um, uh, inland. Lightning has been an issue. Um, and then, of course, flooding. So, you know, there's there's a lot here that we wanted to um, uh, to look at. Now, these hazards, um, 
these these climate hazards can be um, amplified by or by additional challenges. And, and this is just something that, you know, kept coming up in our working with these communities. One is the, you know, a suite of logistical challenges, of course, you know, these are remote and isolated, relatively isolated locations. So because of that, there's limited technical support, um, you know, things like spare parts, maintenance. So, you know, if there's a problem, sometimes it takes longer to fix it, essentially, right? Um, and then there's, you know, changes in demand, um, which is a big piece of the pie here, right? Um, rising demand driven by increasing temperatures, you know, that changes consumer expectations. Um, it also um, causes migration, you know, from um, communities that haven't been electrified yet to these communities that are part of the mini grid pilot program. Um, and um, the installed energy capacity uh, may not be sufficient uh, to keep up with these changes. So those are just things to, to, to you know, um, that we saw come up um, again. Um, so, um, okay, now that we've, you know, I've just introduced some of those you know, potential hazards, um, I do want to speak to um, some of the data and analytics that we um, undertook to support um, investigation of, uh, of those hazards and, and to support resilience. And, um, you know, this is, we'll, we'll, I'll get into it, but this is calling on, you know, much of the same data that um, Sean spoke to and um, the meteorology and hydrology, um, you know, institute have, right? Um, so this is sort of drawing from a common set of underlying um, data. Um, <clears throat> So I just want to say that you know to do this is really like two steps. First is sort of sort of an acquisition or generation of relevant hazard specific data, um, and as I mentioned up top, we're really really thinking we were thinking long longer term in terms of climate projections. So um, we wanted climate data. So these are things like global climate model projections for a suite of variables: solar radiation. Um, to match up with solar PV output, temperature projections, sea level rise, wind. Um, we also wanted to think about storm um, surge and sea level rise modeling to the degree to the degree we could. Um, our climate projections focused on two future time horizons, so we were really thinking about um, these risks at two future time horizons um, out to 2030 and 2050. Um, and we thought about um, projections in terms of relative changes by those time periods relative to a historical baseline. Of course, also want to think uh, more internally about mini grid system data, you know, the capacity ratings, load projections, you know, damage functions. What, you know, what sort of sensitivity does the actual, do the actual systems have to some of the, you know, climate projections that we're looking at? Um, and then um, again, understand we wanted to understand a range of potential impacts. So this 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 goes to what we were. It was a good question that we just had about you know there's uncertainty in climate projections. Should we use them? Well, you know I don't think uncertainty is something we should shy away from. You know we if you can quantify uncertainty and understand a range of potential futures, a worst case and a best case and a middle case, that gives you the information you need to, to move forward and start making, you know, better climate informed decisions. Um, and so that comes back to this risk management framework. And I'll just give you some examples of how we did that. On the, on the right, just to give you ideas of the kinds of data we were looking at, the top panels are solar um, shortwave radiation, just thinking about solar radiation and how um, that could feed solar PVs. You don't need to go into it too, you know, too much here. Um, these are just raw figures. Um, report which we can certainly disseminate. You know, has has more detail and interpretation. But all these are showing is that you know solar radiation is decreasing through time. You know, as the atmosphere warms, there's more cloud development, things like that. Um, you know, there's a slight decrease, but it, it's it's um, you know, it didn't turn out to be incredibly significant. 
Um, on the bottom right is just a lake level. Again, this is Lake Volta's reservoir, so you know you can actually identify flooding events that um, had posed risks to these or, or made these communities exposed to flooding in the past. Um, just want to give a couple uh, examples of some of the exposure work we did. Um, please let me know if I'm running short on time here as well. <laughs> we're running a little short, but I think we're okay overall, Mason, so don't worry okay. about it. Okay, yeah, just feel free to interrupt me. And just remind me, I'll, I can go much quicker in a, a few more slides. But, um, you know, one thing is, um, so increasing temperature, right? Uh, increasing, so there's a increasing average and extreme temperatures. Um, so we used, again, global climate model temperature projections from um, the Royal um, Netherlands um, Meteorological Institute, KNMI, which has um, global uh, climate projections. There's many other places that you know provide climate information as well, um, as Sean was speaking to. Um, but we we got uh, temperature projections. You can for for these two areas, for the lake and actually the river delta, and we looked at those temperature projections, and you can then pair them with um, things like system capacity ratings. So you know for a given rise in temperature, what could be a potential decrease in your um, capacity, in this case, distribution line capacity, um, where we could also look at solar PV and wind turbine output. Um, and this figure here is just a summary of those potential decreases based on the climate projections. So changing capacity, we're looking at two time horizons, 2030 and 2050, for our two regions, the communities up in the northern Lake Volta area, the, the one um, mini grid down in the Volta River Delta. Um, we're thinking about this seasonally, so you can actually have August, which is the cool season, February, which is the warm season. Obviously, there's greater decreases in capacity during the, in the warm season towards February. And these bars, there's a high and low to them, right? So here's again where we're kind of addressing uncertainty in a management risk or a risk management framework where we're saying that we're going to we're going to um, consider both high emissions, a high greenhouse gas emissions future, which is sort of more accelerated climate change, um, which is this representative concentration pathway 8.5. I'm not sure if people are familiar. Please feel free to ask questions after. Um, but the but you can also look at a lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions future, RCP 4.5, and that brackets um, some potential change to give us an idea of you know uh, uh, how risk could play out. And you know um, what we did find is that you know these temperature increases can reduce things like battery capacity in these mini grids by up to seven percent, right? Which is not inconsequential. Um, also thinking about flooding, um, I'll go through these relatively quickly. Apologies, but um, these maps on the on the right are little maps of um, each mini grid site, and the colors, the kind of the blue to yellow, just shows uh, elevation. It's a digital elevation model, and the dark blue is water. <laughs> it's the water level in the lake. It goes up to yellow, which is higher ground. And the, the pink dots, as always, are the actual mini grid locations which were sited on the map. And we worked with um, the Lake Volta uh, River, or sorry, the Volta River Authority to understand future floodplains, or sorry, historical floodplains. And that's what the contours are here. And you can actually see that, you know, um, this is a way to show that the mini grids, we want to evaluate how exposed the mini grid systems were actually to river or lake flooding. Um, they were um, turned out to be properly sited um, high up um, so that they were not exposed. But there are um, things like distribution lines, which is shown here in, the, in, a, in a red star, which take power, of course, from um, the solar PV um, output to um, other buildings. Those were below um, the flood uh, or within the floodplain. And so that that would be an exposed area highlighted for any sort of um, hardening measures. Anyway, these types of maps are something that can be done in the planning stage. These DEMs um, were, are publicly available. They're an Aster Global DEM um, you can use, and you can then plot, you know, flood contours on them to in a planning stage to think about how um, flooding could could occur in the future. Winds, we looked at winds. This is data from the World Bank Climate Change Knowledge Portal. 
Um, just giving some examples of the data we looked at. This is not complete. I just wanted to show this one, say that, you know, it's not always horrible. <laughs> like sometimes, I think as Sean said, like, you know, risks, um, well, some risks are worse than others. Here's one up uh, instance where, based on the data we have available, um, you know, the number of windless days was not projected to decrease much. So, you know, there wasn't, again, based on what we have available, a, um, you know, large anticipated decrease in wind turbine output, particularly at a coastal location. A um, couple more slides. Um, just, you know, we went through, those are some examples, but we went through basically all of these hazards here on the left um, for these sites, you know, so flooding, sea level rise and storm surge, temperature stress, wind stress, solar radiation and cloudiness, extreme weather, including dust. Um, and and we're able to just summarize, you know, what sort of the main um, effects um, were on these on the mini grid systems uh, associated with these risks. Um, we've already touched on on some of them, and and Sean highlighted uh, them as well. Um, and um, but just want to say that once those were identified, then you know you can pivot, and now that you have the data in front of you, you can think about adaptation options. And we just found um, that, you know, resiliency measures, you know, it helps to consider a 360 degree view um, to mitigate risks. So everything from structural measures, you know, to reliability, um, but really importantly, operations and community coordination um, and uh, resilience planning. You know, a lot of the things that we did it for this pilot study is retrospective, um, but, you know, in the future could be done up front to make sure that resilience is incorporated at the planning stage. Um, so I'll, I think I'll stop there. Uh, actually, let me just switch to, um, so this is this slide is just, we can, if anyone has questions, we can go, but this is just um, talking more about these adaptation options. Um, and, I, but I just wanna say that, you know, um, you know, this kind of work obviously has, you know, great, um, uh, Application uh, um, globally, um, particularly in areas where you know hurricanes and extreme weather um, are, are a main issue, like the Caribbean. Um, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of work done in this in this space. And I like showing this figure, which is this resilience you know framework, um, which is really going back down to you know that planning encompasses multiple considerations. You know, both hardening, but also the ability to absorb and recover from, you know, extreme events. Um, so uh, I think I'll stop there. I apologize if I went over time. Um, I also am realizing that up front, I probably didn't give a full uh, introduction to myself, but I'm Mason Fried. It's been great talking to you all. Um, I work at ICF, which is a um, consulting uh, firm. We specialize in climate adaptation resilience work um, and, and part of our work. Um, focuses on um, uh, you know, renewable energy resilience um, projects like this. And so um, it's been great talking. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mason, for a, a really good presentation. Uh, we have a couple questions coming in. And I have several of my own. Um, let, let me use the, the chairman's privilege to, to, to go to something that you kind of closed on. And notice that you know you had that list of different hazards that you might be exposed to, and you, and you have certain frameworks that you use for thinking about building resilience. Um, I, I feel like that is something that people need sometimes. So could you tell us some of the frameworks or tools that are mm. available for people who want to think through what their risks are? And and I'll I'll put in a plug for the Caribbean, um, the Caribbean Center for Climate. Uh, the, Car the Caribbean Community Center for Climate Change, the five C's, our sister organization, has a framework called CCORAL, that's C-C-O-R-A-L, don't ask what it stands for, but it gives a, a good framework for thinking through what the climate risk might be for your particular project. Um, and, and, you know, it's a, it's a nice checklist, basically, and I think those sort of tools are useful to people. Could you give me some of the tools that you have used or would recommend or what resources are available for people to think through what their risks are. And uh, are, you, are we, were you thinking about uh, this, which slide were you? Um, the the second to one? last or third to last one, it was, um, you had like a whole list. It wasn't this one, I think it was a little bit done before. Yeah, there you go. Yes. So you have there oh, a list of things to think through um, and I'm, yeah. I'm sure people would love a checklist like this. So. 
Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's a great question. Um, I think you know the first the first thing to do would probably be to to reach out to um, an institution or a resource um, like that where you know there is on paper some you know a, a checklist of things to actually look into like this column on the left flooding you know sea level rise temperature wind stress you know these these different you know hazards let's say um and then um then you can you know think about more locally whether those hazards really apply to your local project right um and and part of that is doing some data analysis you know as a climate scientist that's I, I often focus on sort of just, you know, the exposure side of things, as Sean said, thinking about, you know, how these hazards actually um, present exposure to, you know, localities of interest. Um, and when you get there, you know, that is, um, you know, that can be difficult to find data, you know, but it's people like Sean and um, the meteorology, meteorology and hydrology um, institute or institute of meteorology and hydrology um, and other public, you know, other um, um, uh, resources that have data that you can call on. Obviously, you know, if, if you're doing a study in Australia or, you um, somewhere in the Caribbean, you know, there there could be different um, places where you're getting data from. But um, there are, you know, there are um, sort of a high level, all there are also high level um, data, you know, providers that have global data. So things like for climate projections, you know, there is um, KNMI, um, which is, again, the Royal um, Danish uh, Meteorology, Meteorology Institute, and you know they have a pretty, you know they have a climate explorer, so they have a relatively, relatively easy, you know, or accessible way to go in and and download or or see, even visualize, you know, climate projection projections for you know locations of interest. So it's it's those kinds of um, resources that um, I find we need to we need to call on. Okay, let's 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 chase that data point for a bit. Um, you mentioned the the Royal Danish one. We have regional institutions. There, there seem to be many agencies that have data and that are doing climate projections. Mm -hmm. um, do these different institutions differ much in their conclusions? How do you decide which institution you you go to or which data set do you use? How do you sift through the many options? It's a great, great, great question. Great question. The the take home, one of the take homes is they do not um, differ significantly. They're not going to, you're not going to, you know, for instance, um, KNMI's projections are not going to reveal some huge increase in temperatures and another, you know, um, resource is going to contradict that, right? So that, they, you know, they're, these, these data portals, um, while they are diverse, um, generally, uh, provide you know similar conclusions, and that's ultimately because they use or draw on a common set of underlying climate projections, which you know if you go back were really are really developed uh, to support things like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So there's you know oversight and there's a sort of standardized nature to this these projections and data. Having said that, um, the different portals you know. Um, in different areas of the world, you know, they differ in what they can provide. Some um, might provide more um, customized variables, you know, derived variables that could be helpful um, to your project. Um, so um, some might have data on humidity or wind, whereas others just do wind uh, temperature and precipitation. Some might have some stuff on extreme temperature and precipitation that is important. So that's a difference. And also um, the other, you know, another big difference is some data providers, uh, well, data providers provide data at different downscaled resolutions. And so some have very coarse, um, you know, raw data, um, but then some downscale that 
to a much finer spatial resolution that's um, more applicable to local um, planning. And something like KNMI, you know, has a, you know, it's it's sort of right in the um, right in the middle. Um, but that, you know, that's it's it's sort of like as it's available. If you can find downscale, you know, projections, that's that's very helpful. All right. Um, one more general question before we get to some specific questions about um, your case study. Um, let's say you don't have much data at all. And then this is a, a situation that's common for a, a couple of islands or places within the Caribbean. Let's say you don't have a good data set. How much, how risky is it to just ignore that completely in your in your energy project? How much risk is introduced if you don't have a comprehensive uh, climate or weather data set? Uh, it's a good way to put it. Um, I'd say that there's a lot of risk. I mean, I you know, look, I'm a I'm a data person, so I I enjoy working with data. I find a lot of power in data. If I if you don't have data, you can still engage in smart planning decisions that incorporate these ideas, right? Um, and maybe, unfortunately, maybe you can't do as um, as an in as in depth of a study as you could elsewhere if you have these data sets at hand, of, of course, you know, but you just have to change the process a little bit to react to that. Um, and, you know, um, you know, maybe you need to stick, take a step up and think about, OK, well, what data is a, an appropriate analog for our, for our community? Or, you know, take even a step back from that and just think, OK, well, you know, how through this decision making process can I incorporate, you know, climate risks, you know, in the way that I can. Um, and even if it's not drawing, you know, perfectly on, you know, local data sets, I, I'd say that the risk, you know, if you're if you're not, if you if we don't, if we don't have that mindset going in, you know, there there's there's there's, um, you know, large potential risk. I agree with you there. Now for your specific um, project here and, and this is really to a question that came in it, it seems like determining the right level of resilience for something that's way out there far away from from support services is pretty critical so when you're doing these isolated mini grids were they built to much higher levels of resilience um than they normally would be if they were more accessible so you can just have them way out wherever they are and not have to worry about them and could you speak to some of those considerations yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's a good question and um, not necessarily, <laughs> um, no. And in fact, you know, um, you know, so this was a pilot program, right? You know, Ghana wants to install up to 300 of these mini grids, you know, in, in the coming years. Um, this was a pilot program for five. And what we found was that, you know, even in this pilot period, you know, they were having um, they were successful. Don't get me wrong; it was a good investment, but there was there was still there were still problems um, that um, had hadn't um, that you know if there had been more resilience planning up front, you know maybe some of those risks would have been mitigated, um, and and these pilot locations would have been even more successful. Uh, what we found. You know, this this our study was retrospective, so we were go these pilot mini grids have already been put in. We were going there and assessing them, right, um, to provide information that could make the rest of the 300 mini grids that could be installed, you know, more resilient in the future to improve that planning process. And and what we found is that you know resilience, climate resilience, what you know wasn't a prime, you know, was not a primary consideration for the pilot, um, and it was a, you know in some ways a lesson learned. Um, these were not. Um, they were successful. These mini grids are, are running and a great benefit to their communities, but um, it wasn't that there was like an order of magnitude, you know, greater like hardening that had gone into them up front because they were uh, rural. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. A question from the Q&A from Anonymous. On the projected increase in temperature slide, was the increase in load incorporated within the analysis along with the duration of the line capacity, generation output and battery capacity further stress on put further stress on the system? Um, that would be an increase in 
A further stress on the system would be an increase in the customer usage for cooling. So I couldn't quite read that one properly. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's great and exactly right. And and we we discussed this that interplay um, in the report that um, you know load creases are not incorporated in in this figure here. Um, this is um, you know just thinking about um, you know the system capacity itself, uh, but um, for us. You know, in a subsequent analysis, we combine the insights from a figure like this with the potential for um, greater demand, you know, from cooling, et cetera, and how that could combine, combine to um, further stress the system. Um, but you know, th but that that is that it, that's really that's really you know a great point, and and it kind of goes back here to you know changes in demand are you know one of these like moving goal, you know, it's a, it's a moving variable that has has um, large implications for for um, the resilience of these systems. All right, last question now before we, we head to Sherry, who I know has been waiting a little bit longer than she should have. Um, is there any organization developing new building codes or modifying existing building codes to meet increasing loads from wind and water hazards anywhere in Ghana, where were you working? Mm. It's a great question and unfortunately, I have to say I don't, I really don't know the answer. Um, it's kind of one of those questions that I think some some of the people I worked with, <laughs> particularly in Ghana, um, would know. Um, and if that's that's something that we could look into, but unfortunately, I don't I don't know. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mason, for interesting discussion, interesting presentation. Uh, now we want to turn over to our friend Sherry. Uh, from NREL. We had introduced her before, but just to remind you, Sherry has worked a lot in island systems. She's the Arctic Strategy Program Manager and Senior Research Engineer uh, at NREL. Um, she's been looking at resilient energy transitions at multiple scales. Um, she spent a lot of time on islands, some of them colder than the ones uh, who may be in the audience right now, but they still have some characteristics. Um, that are similar and she has a lot of interesting knowledge to share. So over to you, Sherry, please. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I do spend time on Caribbean islands too. It's uh, have to balance out those Arctic temperatures uh, <laughs> with some warmer weather. Um, I also want to note that uh, James Ellsworth will also be presenting with me uh, today as he's been taking on a larger and larger piece of this work. Um, so James, if you want to go ahead and go to the the first slide. Um, so I think we've kind of touched on this a little bit and particularly uh, thank you to, to Mason for that last uh, presentation. Um, ultimately, why does energy resilience matter is sort of where we want to start. Um, we often have islands uh, come to NREL and, and by the way, I guess we should probably introduce that. We are one of the 17 US Department of Energy um, national research facilities. And so our goal as the National Renewable Energy Laboratory is specifically energy efficiency and renewable energy, as well as the grid integration that goes with that. Um, but when we talk about energy resilience, often we hear from our partner nations or partner islands, um, partner cities, hey, we wanna be resilient. Um, and usually the first question we're gonna ask them is resilient to what and to what end? Um, and as, as Mason just mentioned, um, you know, Resilience is often better when it's planned um, in sort of a larger planning process. And so that's what we're looking at. You know, is, is your nation looking to empower women and youth? Are you looking for greater economic opportunity or reduced cost? Um, you know, how does education roll into this? Is it a health and sanitation issue? So any variety of these sort of uh, reasons that you would want the energy grid um, to be more resilient. For those who have been watching the US, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a million people without power for almost a week um, in one of our southern states in Texas. Um, and that was really a great case study and not resilience. But when they start looking at, do people have to boil water? We still have some communities boiling water. It becomes a health and sanitation issue. So really, it's not just about making energy resilient um, because we like electrons flowing, but it's what do those electrons accomplish when they're flowing in the system? Go ahead, James. So what is resilience? And we've sort of seen a variety of definitions of this. Um, it, at its most basic level, we're talking about the ability to recover after the application of stress. Um, NREL specifically uses 
Um, this following definition that resilience is the ability to prepare for and adapt to changing conditions and with cover and withstand and recover from deliberate attacks, accidents or naturally occurring threats or incidents. So we really take an all what we call an all hazards approach, not just climate. Today we're going to be focusing on climate, but if you have questions on some of those non climate threats and hazards, um, we can, you know, reach out and, and we can chat about that later. Go ahead, James. And again, so what's the motivation for power sector resilience and power sector resilience planning? Um, and ultimately, it's that the power system is really essential to providing other basic services. Everything um, from growth and development in the country for economic development, um, but also for water systems, for food systems, for transportation. Um, and the power system, as we've seen today, faces a variety of potential risks from a variety of different hazard sources. Um, and so what you're looking to do is how can we make the power system thrive under those changing conditions, particularly in the face of climate change that may have more uncertainty than what we're used to dealing with. Go ahead. Um, so, so island specific considerations, um, as Gerald mentioned, I love working on islands. Uh, some of the islands I work on are so remote that I have been stuck in the middle of the Bering Sea um, because the only way on or off the island is a helicopter. Um, but, you know, islands have very specific considerations compared to bigger um, grid tied um, entities like U.S. states or countries that are intertied to each other. Um, and so when we, we start looking at some of the island specific um, considerations. We look at weather related events and power infrastructure. You know, it's it's rare in the United States, not unheard of, but fairly rare that you get a major storm that covers most, if not all of the country of the sort of contiguous U.S. Um, whereas our island nations or island states, um, island territories can, can really experience that quite frequently. So if you think of major storms that have gone through Puerto Rico, through Haiti, um, through any of the islands that are on the phone today, often a storm can cover the entire system, which means you can't be flexible to change how your system's operating. And we also have that price volatility related to fuel, you know, fuel being imported from outside. Um, I know Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago doesn't necessarily have that same issue, but a lot of our island nations really do if they have to bring in fuel supplies for things like diesel generation or petroleum based generation for electricity. Um, and it, exacerbating that is in post disaster situations, particularly if you've lost things like ports. Um, now you're looking at we have to get fuel in, but now we can't get it in. And so how do you deal with that? Um, so there's a few other, you know, var variability of renewable resources. Again, larger contiguous countries. You can take solar from here during the morning and solar from here during the afternoon. Islands, you have much, much less ability for spatial diversity um, in planning some of those renewables. Um, and then we also have those inner ties. So how do the communities, how do community vulnerabilities relate to that, to those any kind of power disruptions? So outages for things like critical facilities or health impacts, um, and also, and obviously the social and financial impacts of power outages as well. Go ahead. Um, and Mason touched on this, which I appreciate for setting this up so well. Um, but when we talk about effective resilience planning, one of the things that we really want to do is make sure this is part of an existing planning process. Um, and it's not just standalone. You know, if you do this sort of vulnerability assessment um, just by itself and don't tie it to other pieces of sort of national planning, um, often it just is a report that goes on a shelf um, and doesn't really get well incorporated into how does your system function. Um, another thing we see is often um, we see resilience planning that just happens at the utility level or maybe just the regulator, but doesn't really include that broader um, community resilience. It doesn't include broader sort of electricity dependent system resilience planning. Um, or the other thing we see is sometimes like, OK, we've done a resilience plan one and done. Um, and I know through CCRE, having having done some of the other webinars, um, has really emphasized this is an iterative process. It's not one and done, um, particularly with climate change, as we understand more and more what some of the impacts are going to be. This this does this process does need to be uh, updated periodically. Um, and then also, this is a really, really big one. The plan needs to be linked to some sort of implementation plan and financing. It's one thing to study the problem and study the problem and tell what the problem is. Um, but if you can't actually implement it and find the financing, find the funding, um, it's going to be really hard to actually become a more resilient system. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit here about dependencies and interdependencies. Um, just a minute. Go ahead, James. There we go. Um, so one of the things you really want to talk about is when you're looking at resilience, 
what are the dependencies in the system and what are interdependencies? Um, and so if you look at this this chart, it's, it's very simplified of just a dependency is asset A, say your power sector um, is uh, will affect how well asset B, say your water supply will function. If you do not have power, you do not have clean water going into your homes. That's a direct dependency. Whereas an interdependency is bi-directional, they go both ways. And so when you start talking about, say, the hydro resources um, that Sean brought up earlier, reduction in water um, can can affect your power system by, you know, you're going to have less water to to generate hydroelectricity. So you might switch over to, say, a thermal thermal system, um, petroleum based. But now you also have reduced water for cooling. And so your systems become very interdependent and you have to figure out what is the best use of water? Is it for cooling for thermoelectric plants or is it use of the hydroelectric plants? And so you get these really these really tightly wound interdependencies where you have to make trade off decisions, whereas dependencies asset A needs to work for asset B to work. And so it's a little bit of, of how we look at resilience as well is what are some of those trade offs? Go ahead, James. All right, and so I'm actually going to turn it over to James here. He's been working on some of this uh, with the resilience team to talk about resilience attributes and what does this mean for renewables. Okay, hi. I thought, all right. Um, I was, yeah. Um, are you, I thought I was going to go later. Sorry. Are you, are you, um, I thought you were going to take this one. <laughs> Oh, I can I can definitely take this one. Sorry, I had we have a little miscommunication this morning. It's still early here, um, but yeah, I can go ahead and, and run with this. Um, so when we talk about resilience, there's a variety of ways to to really measure that, to quantify that. We've seen a couple this morning looking at vulnerabilities and risk, but this is a, a pretty easy way. This is known as the five R's. It was originally developed in the social sciences, but is now being applied in a variety of other ways. But we talk about robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness response and recovery. And those don't have to all be ours, but it just makes it sound good that there's five R's. Um, but when we talk about things like robustness, that's when you hear terms like system hardening, meaning doing things like um, undergrounding of lines, for example, that your system is harder because the winds and the storms aren't necessarily going to impact your system the same way. So it's robust. It, it, it tends to be um, better designed for the climate. So things like sealing of inverters or sealing um, of, of systems to keep water out, that, that tends to be sort of in the robust category. Redundancy is pretty self-explanatory. Do you have more than one option? Um, this is where renewable energy, um, particularly solar because of its modular nature and even small scale wind is really useful. Um, definitely the growing battery market because it can be really redundant and you can send power from a variety of different directions. Um, often critical facilities will maybe have two feeders that are sending power towards them. And that really is for that redundancy. If for some reason this line or this feeder goes down, we can serve power from here. And this is where we see microgrids on bigger grids um, become really important in a lot of resilience planning. Um, resourcefulness is diversity. So think about diversity. Do we have wind? Do we have solar? Do we have thermal? Do we have hydro? And how can we change and use those differently based on what you know the current need is in terms of load? based on what the current climate's doing, what the current weather is doing. Can we can we diversify our options so that we can be flexible to meet the needs that we have? Um, and response really starts going into if you have an issue, how quickly can the system respond to it? Um, so do you have smart controls? Um, do you have response plans when it comes to things like inclement weather, weather or storms, or even earthquakes? Um, so that response is how quickly um, how quickly can you actually respond to an event happening, which goes into recovery, which is you've had an event. Now, how quickly can you get back to operating as normal? Um, and so that's stuff like having spare parts, um, having you know utility coordination, maybe between between islands or between other nations. Um, do you have staff that can, can can help with recovery versus just normal operations? So go ahead, James. All right, um, and so we're going to talk about some some policy things here or just some, some solutions here. You know, it, it'd be really great if we could just say if you add this one little widget, if you add this one technology option, that's going to make all of your systems resilient to everything. Um, unfortunately, we have not figured out what that technology might be. 
Um, and so when we look at solutions, we look at things like policy, yes, those technical solutions, but also programs and then capital projects. You know, how does this all come out in the financing? Um, and so when we look at policy things, we're looking at like long-term planning, but as, as well as regulations, policy procedures, um, technical solutions we'll get into here on the renewable side, as well as programs and, and what it looks like to have capital projects. Go ahead, James. Ah, there we go. And James is going to take over from here now that I have my slide order uh, right. So James, do you want to jump in on resilient siting? That sounds good to me and sorry for that confusion. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for covering that. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, James Ellsworth. Um, I think a lot of you know me from some of these past webinars, but quickly I'm a research engineer and work with Sherry at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory as well uh, out here in Golden, Colorado. Um, and I'll talk about, yeah, some siting and design considerations for renewable energy systems. I'll start with renewable energy systems in general, then speak specifically to solar for a while because I have a lot of experience uh, in that area. And a lot of these things have been touched on uh, in these first couple intro slides, but overall, just why renewables uh, for island power sector resilience and you can look at a couple different reasons on this slide we have economics and logistics um, if you're looking at renewables if you're looking at solar or wind you save on fuel costs your fuel is free right it's in the sun and in the air uh, it's a local source of electricity and that allows money to circulate in the lo local economy but also you're not paying for um, for fuel imports and subject to kind of the volatility in fuel prices uh, that you don't control and then also logistics uh, if you are if you are reliant on for an imported fuel to power your generators uh, if you have an event like sure i mentioned maybe one that shuts down your ports or uh, anything else that disrupts the shipment of those fuel to the island uh, you are stuck with what you have uh, in supply whereas if you have more renewable energy more solar more wind more hydro in your mix you can rely on the supply that's uh, going to be there and then also because it's modular uh, especially solar distributed solar renewable energy it does make it a prime candidate for pairing uh, with storage systems that can increase the amount of time that it, your system can provide power at, after an event. So specifically renewable energy here, uh, a couple other advantages of it. Uh, it diversifying the generation mix, uh, as some of our other speakers have mentioned here, getting from multiple fuel sources leaves you less vulnerable to any disruption in any one of those fuel sources. Um, can reduce some water use, some of the vulnerabilities that we've seen uh, like from Sean's presentation. Uh, enabling mod modular and rapid development, you know, being distributed and smaller in nature, putting in, you can build up, start small, with, you know, megawatts of solar and just build up as you need or as you want to incorporate more solar into your mix versus the need to commit to one large power plant uh, right away. And you can also spread out where, I'm using solar as an example here a lot, but you can spread out where that's located uh, in order to have some flexibility with what parts of the grid it's powering or just different geographical constraints. Uh, islanding, if you're able to uh, island the systems and separate them from the grid, if you have a grid outage or have transmission lines that are down, you still might be able to provide local power where those uh, where those distributed generation assets are. And then again, coupling with backup power um, can help increase the duration or the time that you can provide power should the grid be down, say. Um, but then, and then also, uh, black star, if your system's down, you need you need some power to actually start your grid back up again. And if you have if you're relying on a resource like the sun or wind that's there, uh, then you can use that to power uh, the actual start restart up of your grid should it go down. Uh, and also, you know, rather compared to having something like a uh, standby diesel diesel generator that might just be used as a backup scenario uh, in a time of emergency or problem, uh, using renewable energy resources like solar as um, as your resilient solution doesn't only serve value during that time that you're using it as you know a backup or emergency power supply. It's also providing you value throughout the year. So now shifting to solar specifically uh, and resilience considerations with solar, and this is something, uh, an area where uh, I'm part of a team is doing a lot of work in this area of actually solar PV storm hardening uh, for resilience, you know, especially in the face of severe weather events such as hurricanes. Uh, and our team went down to uh, the Caribbean, to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands after the 2017 hurricanes, Irma and Maria. We looked at a whole bunch of solar systems, some that had been destroyed, some that looked like nothing had happened, tried to kind of look at the design features of those and kind of parse out some best practices to try to help those systems 
survive that damage. And so we've heard a little bit uh, earlier today in the presentations about the you know, effects of changing climate on production of solar. You know, if you have higher temperatures, if you have dust, things like that. Um, but what I'm going to focus on here is actually siting and design considerations that you might need to consider more given the different climate hazards that you might face throughout the life of a system. So having an eye towards are hurricanes going to occur more often? Is what we considered a 100 year storm before going to be a 50 or 25 year storm now? And I'm sure it's a terrifying thought to a lot of you that have lived through these events, but this is a reality we have to consider when planning for our power system. And the overall, I guess, overall theme here, and Sherry alluded to this too, is that you know just taking solar and just plopping down solar panels in a field doesn't automatically equal resilience. You, know, you have to try to plan for what events that that specific site might face in order to ensure that those assets are there after whatever event happens so that they can provide power you know, at a time when it's often needed the most. So again, yeah, if designed and operated appropriately, on-site generation can definitely be a resilient strategy. And if you're designing your systems to be resilient, which you all should be doing, uh, then look at that site-specific and hazard-based design, design for you know, a, that scenario that, that will test the resilience of the system. Include energy storage and islanding controls, uh, and then also preparation and plans, like Sherry mentioned, and we'll get to some of those on some of the future slides. So there's a bunch on this slide. Uh, we'll talk about the first um, the first couple lines in this table um, now, and then the uh, bottom four we'll get into in more detail on, on future slides. Uh, but looking at uh, the on-site energy generation category, looking at some gaps and opportunity and solutions. Um, and with solar, this is, an, this is an area I can talk about all day, and I'll try not to nerd out too much on this and standards and uh, tiny design features here. But if anybody is interesting and wants to hear more, please reach out. I'm happy to go into a lot of this in more depth um, outside of this, or feel free to ask questions in the chat too. But one gap is lack of codes. And I think a lot of people assume that just because your system is designed to a certain code or standard and it gets that stamp that it's met the minimum thresholds, that it will be adequate and can survive today and future climate, uh, climate issues. And that's not necessarily always the case. A lot of these codes and standards are kind of playing catch up with what's actually being seen in the field and these different ever-changing climate risks. So I encourage to design you know, above just minimum thresholds. There's one example in this opportunity and solutions here about um, solar systems being designed for static wind loading conditions, which is just like a simple weight put on top of the panels. It's actually more representative of something like a snow load rather than a wind load. Uh, when you get wind on the systems, they can move, they can you can get all sorts of forces on them that they weren't necessarily designed or expected to have, and that can cause damage um, even below the wind speeds that they were designed for. Um, site inspections too. Don't assume that uh, your system is necessarily installed according to how it's designed. This is something we saw a lot when we went to um, uh, look at these systems in the Caribbean. There were a lot of signs that they weren't like all the specific parts and components of the system that were specified in the designs weren't those that were actually used in the installation. And then that during the installation, it might not have been done according to the standards uh, that they should have been. Simple things like making sure your the bolts and nuts on your system were torqued according to the specifications. If not, they can come loose, especially as they vibrate in winds. Um, and it's such a simple thing that could have prevented a lot of damage. All right, these last, uh, we'll get into the last points on this slide uh, on coming slides. Uh, so going forward, uh, the idea is to try to avoid what's happening in that left picture there. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen photos like that. It's, um, it, it's not the norm. <laughs> Solar typically does survive uh, and hold up well to severe stresses and winds, but uh, you know, without careful attention to design, installation, and maintenance, you can get larger scale damage like in that picture. And you know, sometimes, sure, I know I know you all are very familiar with how strong uh, and devastating a hurricane can be, and there's a good chance it would cause some damage anyway, but the things I'm going to talk about will focus on at least trying to limit the amount of damage and being able to provide some power after a disaster. And a lot of those considerations are for things like hardware siting, system design, and sizing. So construction considerations and looking at your actual site selection, uh, look at your hazards for where you're actually siting this. And those can be 
things like floods or storm surge levels. Um, the picture in the top there shows a flooded PV site where it looks like it looks like those string inverters in the white boxes just barely uh, were above the flood lines there. Um, that's from a hurricane that hit North Carolina here in the United States, but uh, the site was flooded, uh, which did cause some electrical damage, but also prevented anyone from being able to get to the site to assess the damage and to look at uh, repowering it and if it could provide power. Uh, and again, we're designing to certain flood levels today, maybe 100 year flood level that might be changing going forward, especially as we're looking at PV plants. You know, we used to talk about a 25 year lifetime, but now we're starting to talk about, you know, 40 or 50 year lifetimes for these PV plants. Um, that's going to increase the likelihood that it will experience one of these hazards. And so, you know, in designing, definitely have to keep those changing risks in mind. Also important to look at, you know, soils and uh, including good drainage uh, management systems. You can see a site on the right there that did not do that and had a pretty much a washout with a lot of their foundation. Uh, and then here's a fun idea that I haven't seen adopted a lot yet, but uh, putting some kind of perimeter wind fence around an array to actually try to reduce the wind loads on that on the solar array. Uh, and so at the, I will try to not get too deep into this next slide here uh, because I don't, I'm sure most people in the audience aren't as interested in talking about uh, bolts and nuts and fasteners as much as I am here, but um, I mention it specifically because it's the number one thing that goes wrong in systems that destroy are destroyed. Uh, that like that slide I showed of the totally destroyed system a couple slides back. Um, the fact is something we hear over and over again. It's these fasteners that hold, especially those that hold the modules to the racking that are almost always cited as the thing that goes wrong. And so making sure that they're designed for the expected wind loads, uh, avoiding these top down clamps. I know they're semi ubiquitous in the industry, but what they do is they actually, and that's what's shown in the picture up there, they actually hold, use a clamping force of one module to hold the next one in place. So if just one of them goes wrong, not only is it not holding that first module in place, but the second one's not held in, that can come loose, the third one can, and so on. So you can get kind of a domino or cascading failure uh, effect there. There's other things you can do, like using locking fasteners or washers and avoiding self tapping screws. Um, some of the things we've been recommending is using fixed tilt arrays rather than trackers uh, for their stronger structural stability. There's weird things that can happen to tracking systems too, even at really low winds where they can almost, if it, they catch the wind right, can resonate um, and cause everything to just, yeah, they can cause some pretty big damage. Let's leave it at that. Uh, and then there's some also just using more pieces of your racking in your structural support system on PV systems as well. And if you're on a rooftop array, make sure it's attached directly to the roof and not just uh, held in place with concrete blocks. And I'll try to go through these next couple quickly here. Um, but this is something we're doing actually currently uh, for, Port for Puerto Rico. Uh, and it's along the lines of what Sherry said of the importance to have a plan. Uh, what you're going to do before a storm, what you're going to do afterwards. Uh, and those checklists that we are developing there, um, you know, they will be specifically made for Puerto Rico, but it's, you know, with an eye towards potential hurricane threats. So it'll apply to, you know, at least most of the attendees and countries and islands on this call. I know places like Guyana might not, might be fortunate enough to avoid, you know, some of these threats, but I think almost all the other islands, you're all too familiar with this. Uh, so we'll make sure to send these checklists out to uh, to Sikri and let them distribute them when when we have them available. But um, it ranges, you know, the things that you should do before a storm. And, you know, luckily, uh, well, one good thing about hurricanes is you can see them coming. They don't just sneak up on you. So you do have a little bit of time to try to secure uh, your solar assets. And that can be th simple things like removing debris that could blow into your system and cause damage. Make sure your drainage is working. I talked about the bolts and nuts a lot. Tightening them up before a storm can save a huge amount of damage. And it's a relatively simple thing to do. And then making sure you don't have wiring like is on the right there where you've got dangling wires that aren't appropriately cable tied up and can swing around and blow around the wind and get soaked and cause a lot of more damage there as well. Uh, and then after the storm, you know, walk the site for damage. Make sure uh, your electrical pathways are all good and functioning before powering the array back on if you powered it down before or if there was or if it was somehow shut down in the event you know checking for water in all your electrical boxes checking everything's connected well and then one thing also stress is it's good to do um some kind of 
you know, production damage assessment using something like electroluminescence imaging, which is shown up at the right there. Without going into too much detail, there can be damage to the system that you won't be able to see just by looking at it or testing it that can reduce the um, reduce the production of your system over time and get worse and worse over time. And it's important to address that up front, whether it's um, because of an insurance claim or a warranty issue, you want to make sure that all the damage is actually covered. OK, and I think uh, I think I'm going back to Sherry now for uh, to close out the rest of the slides, if that sounds if that sounds right. Yep, and we should be okay. able to close these out pretty quickly. Um, I know we're running short on time, uh, but one of the other things we want to talk about, as I mentioned, not all solutions are technical. Um, and so a really, really significant one that we see more and more is making sure that the workforce is ready for a resilient system, particularly if you're changing from being primarily sort of one source of energy, say maybe petroleum based or hydro based, and now you're incorporating new technologies like solar and wind, making sure that the staff is trained to handle some of the, the questions that will arise with that. Um, but also having staff that's cross-trained. So uh, for example, if you have just one operator who does everything and that person can't make it to work one day or you know, you've had a major event and they can't get to the facility, making sure you have staff that can fill in for those roles. Um, one of the big things we see is just robust maintenance. Um, and I'll use the US grid as an example. A couple of years ago, we had some major wildfires um, in California. Um, Quite a few people um, actually lost their lives. A lot of people lost homes and obviously the power grid went down and come to find out the cause of that fire was a clamp um, on a transmission line that failed um, because it hadn't had maintenance. Um, and so some of those kinds of things, obviously trees are a huge one during storms. Are trees cut away from power lines or trees cut away from some of those solar rays like what James is talking about? Um, and so just having those robust maintenance plans really matter. Um, also staffing at redundant locations. If you lose, you know, a facility and ability to control your grid from one place, can you actually, you know, what we would call continuity of operations. Can you relocate some of those um, those operations to another location? Um, and then particularly for those who have more remote systems, more rural systems, making sure that you can provide that capacity support uh, for those operators. Go ahead, James. Um, and then the policies, I can't stress this enough. Um, again, back to sort of this needs to be part of an overarching process, but rate structures or incentive programs that incentivize um, resilient power, both in the development, but also in its use. Um, having just interconnection processes is something we see a lot as people are interconnecting solar to the grid. It's cheap, it's actually fairly easy, um, and they may not be going through a robust interconnection process, and that can actually hurt your grid more than it helps it. Um, including those financing mechanisms to actually implement some of these solutions, um, but just overarching policy and regula re regulatory goals for resilient design. Things like don't site your system um, be below the flood zone, below, below the flood line, um, and having some of those standards in place, those safety standards in place uh, that support that infrastructure. Uh, go ahead, James. All right, and then just some programs to think about. Again, just if you're going to implement programs to aid in resilience of the power sector of the the you know the physical system, you know, doing those workforce development programs, what many of you are doing right now, creating an IRRP and updating it regularly. Um, as um, as Sean mentioned, you know, having the geospatial data with with hazards, but you can also overlay that thing with things like system assets. And oh, what system assets do we have that might be in a hazard zone we weren't anticipating? You know, those kinds of things and developing those programs, keeping that data alive and, and updated um, can really enhance per it can really enhance resilience. Um, but then also when we haven't talked about a whole lot, um, I think Mason touched on it a bit, but how do you work with the community in all of this? You know, it's one thing to say, you know, we're we're enhancing resilience. Um, but how do you work with the community? How do you work with the residents? How do you work with the customers and say this is what we're trying to do to enhance resilience? Um, this is how this is how you interact with that process. For example, like demand response, or even if you're having a major storm. Um, I saw someone that is expecting six, six inches of snow uh, this weekend. We're expecting up to four feet of snow this weekend. So the power companies have already started issuing, you know, hey, can you help us out on power? It's going to be a rough weekend. Um, we're probably going to have some outages, 
um, you know, those kind of communication plans, getting ahead of those events can often help in the restoration of power, which increases that recovery, which increases the resilience of the system. Um, but also even things like trade in their incentive programs to adopt efficiency measures and take some of that load off the grid. Those kinds of programs that are maybe not you know, installing a new solar array or, or putting your uh, wires underground, but really increase the efficiency of the system, increase the awareness of how the system operates can also really help enhance resilience. Go ahead, James. So just a few key takeaways for today and then we'll open up for questions. Um, but DG, um, distributed generation, particularly solar and sometimes distributed wind, can play a really valuable role in power sector uh, resilience in the Caribbean if it's done right. Um, and that, that done right means appropriate design of the site, of a solar array of PV, um, pre uh, preparing the sites prior to ma major storms, preparing assets prior to major storms, um, and just looking to reduce the, the balance of system failure during major events. These are all things that can really help with making your system more resilient, adding those programs, helping the workforce, all of these things can really make your systems more resilient. Um, there's not a one size solution, you know, a one size fits all solution. Um, but figuring out what makes the most sense in your context um, can really enhance resilience of your grids. Um, so with that, uh, Gerald, I'll turn it back to you. Um, James, if you want to pop on also to maybe answer some questions. All right. Thank you very much, Sherry and James. Great presentation. I especially liked some of the points you were making, Sherry, around policy and around on people. I think one of the things we've learned from this pandemic that is that um, human behavior <laughs> matters a lot yeah. for resilience. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the way people act will determine how how a, a, a system can can respond or can or can you know, sink or, or swim in, in, a, in a trying time. So I really appreciate some of the things you are saying, especially. Um, we have a lot of questions. We are going to try and take them within about 10 minutes just so we can keep on time. Um, James, let me turn to well, James and Sherry, but turning to some of the 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 very practical things you presented on on solar. Um, let me go from the well. Here's one from many island locations. The extremely corrosive environment, and I think you're talking about really salt spray here, causes havoc with electronics of, of solar systems. How can we make solar PV systems less vulnerable to to that particular environmental? hazard yeah that's a good question it's one it's definitely a big consideration um and there are certain things you can do uh choosing you know choosing the metals in your system making sure they're compatible metals uh to get technical making sure for this for your steel that you're using 300 series steel maybe 316 marine grade uh things for all your bolts and fasteners though which is something that you know, might not be specified in your original design drawings, or it's something if you're putting out an RFP for a system, you know, you might include that, that we need to design for this marine corrosive, corrosive environment. Um, and then, yeah, and make sure that you've, you know, you have your corrosion engineers weigh in on the project and, uh, and give it the okay. Um, yeah. Thanks for that, James. I see another question on, on solar design as well. One of the major design issues with intense winds as is in the case with hurricanes, it's not just a wind load, but the debris that gets carried by the wind. And this person references Dominica in particular. Um, I think you touched on this, James, but could you go again? What, how can designs be improved to consider impact loads? Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, and you mentioned it a little bit, um, but some, I mean, a lot of it comes down to siting, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, one could be just siting it somewhere where you know you've cleared the area or you know or take into consideration what debris might you know fall into your way we've seen uh, there was a pv system in iowa in the middle of the us recently that got a windstorm and was destroyed but a lot of the damage came from just this old satellite dish that was up on the roof that happened to fall down on it and it wasn't even being used anymore or some like telecommunications equipment at least but that caused damage um, i mentioned if you know a storm or high wind event is coming just walking through the site and making sure it's clear of any debris that might be there. Um, obviously, at some point there's debris that could be out of your control that might blow into your site, but I think doing what you can and with siting and you know, with siting and clearing the site is um, will help a lot and likely prevent a lot of damage. And I'm going to jump in on that angle of impact matters a lot. Um, and so uh, I will 
make this announcement, but just it's after COVID. When COVID settles down, if anyone ever uh, gets a chance to come to Colorado, please let us know and come out to the lab. We'd love to have you. Uh, we actually do have a cannon that shoots chunks of ice at solar panels to see how they perform <laughs> under impact. It's awesome. Everybody to see it. Um, but here in Colorado, um, and actually the building that's behind me and James and our pictures, uh, you know, we have a lot of hail and it's not uh, unheard of. In fact, about three years, four years ago now, we had um, softball size hail um, and there's 300 or there's 3000 solar panels on the roof of that building. We lost one um, and it had to do with a couple of things. One, we did have more premium panels to the angle of impact. So rather the, the panels are not flat. And so rather than having a 90 degree perpendicular impact, our panels are tilted about 15 degrees. And that was just enough to let the ice more bounce off of them than impact them directly and, and break them. Um, and so one of the things that we're trying to understand is pre-storm, is there a way that if you have say panels that are on like a single axis tracking or even dual axis tracking, harder with flat plate panels, um, is there a way that you can actually, is there an optimal angle to tilt them? We don't know the answer to that yet. That is kind of where current research is going because if we can adjust the angle of most of the impact coming in from a storm, we might be able to save more panels. Um, and so that's some of the current research happening. Um, we don't have an answer yet, but that is maybe one way to go is, is try and play with the angle of the actual panels if you can. Okay. I've been I've been trying to get onto that hail cannon testing team for a while, but uh, I guess this, I guess there's a long wait list. <laughs> I, it's pretty I fun. There must. <laughs> oh goodness! Um, I see uh, there's a question posted and answered in the chat, and thanks for that, Sherry. Um, the question was, what are the capital cost implications for all these enhanced resilience measures for solar PV? Do you recommend stakeholders also then start to use a resilience hardened PV capex in long-term planning where hurricanes are applicable? And Sherry posted a great answer. She she gave us a worksheet, a cost worksheet that speaks to storm hardening considerations. You want to remark a little bit on that real quick, Sherry? I will, and I'll turn to James since he's one of the authors. Um, but um, one, of the, one of the things is, yes, the CapEx is higher, but the goal is to keep the OpEx lower. And so one of the things is really look at the lifespan um, of the system. Um, and so a lot of those capital costs are not necessarily higher. Some of them are. Um, but the best way in that long term planning is really to look at both your CapEx and your OpEx um, and really even more so the cost of replacement. Um, that if you're not storm hardened and you're in a hurricane zone, there is a pretty significant chance you're going to you know, have to replace a system in that 30 year lifespan. And so if you can get to that 30 year lifespan without a full re replacement, you know, that's where we start really looking at these at these measures. Um, but James, do you want to talk to um, to what you guys developed on the cost differences? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, and that that report looks at a whole bunch of different measures. Some of the things I was talking about, like different bolts and uh, bolts and nuts and washers, and it goes on a cost by cost basis. You know, what's your upfront capex premium on those things, um, and that's what that looks at. And that's kind of phase one. Uh, and and for some of them, there's not. Uh, like I talked about through bolting compared to using uh, these top down clamps, there's not really much of a cost difference there. Um, from parts perspective, it's probably cheaper, but it might take more maintenance, uh, more labor to actually, um, sorry, not maintenance, but labor to actually install those. Um, but then the next phase is definitely, yeah, to look at those lifetime cost implications. If you install it better up front, you're going to have to, you know, you know, ma maintain it less and do, um, you know, less work on it throughout the lifetime and then hopefully avoid a lot of damage. And from a resilience perspective, yeah, we can look at repair costs that you'd have to get back. You could loss of production too, uh, whether that's power when you really need it to provide communities power after a disaster or whether it's just a revenue stream that you're looking at of trying to make sure you have power production that can be financially have a bigger impact if they, the more damage you have the less power you're producing that has a big financial impact if you have damage to things like inverters on your system those can take a while to get replacements of uh, and that can be you know weeks of downtime and so there's all these lifetime considerations that um, that when you consider those all uh, it really makes the case for you know installing a more robust, stronger system up front. Let me try and paraphrase another question we have here. Um, questions looking at policy development that looks at land usage around critical infrastructure, for example, solar PV, ground, ground multi solar PV, since you know some of the things in the environments then can themselves become hazards. Um, should land use policy 
um, be an aspect of resilience for energy installations? Oh, absolutely. Um, and we don't have her on the call today, but one of my colleagues is an urban planner and specifically looks at the land use side of resilience. Um, and part of it can be challenging, particularly with critical facilities they are often within more densely populated cities. Um, for example, hospitals. And so it's like, okay, where do we actually put solar? Um, how can we put solar around this critical facility um, when we don't have any land base? And so you look at rooftops and that sort of thing. Um, but if you're developing new developments or expanding cities out, expanding some of those critical facilities, including in the upfront planning of new development, whether that's housing, whether that's hospitals, whatever, schools, um, including in the development of that the land use around energy assets. And I would say not just solar, but a bigger one is batteries. Um, and particularly when you start citing um, batteries near people, batteries are overwhelmingly safe. We do have some, you know, some particular issues around some of the off gases. And obviously there have been some fires. We had one in Arizona. Um, there's actually really, there's pretty good codes and code examples out of places like New York, out of Australia, uh, related to where do you cite assets like batteries in a way that they're going to be safe, even if they're packed in with people. Um, so, for example, New York has different battery land use codes depending on if they're cited in occupied buildings versus unoccupied. Um, Australia has uh, battery citing codes and land use requirements depending if a battery is coastal or non-coastal um, or if they're in a wildfire zone or not. Um, so you can actually take a lot of those kinds of codes and standards and adopt them to your specific needs. Um, but the overarching goal is when you're doing that land use planning for new things, including the energy assets right up front, because then if you're going to go to like a microgrid where you can island those assets, if, it, if the whole grid goes down, they're right there on site. Um, but then you've also got the safety features included so that they're going to minimize the safety hazards during something like a major storm. Um, so yeah, land use is absolutely critical to this. Um, that integrated policy around resilience that's not just electricity, but the broader aspect of resilience is very critical to this. Uh, we are running short of time. We wanted to finish at 12.30 and it's 12.29. So one final question since you mentioned batteries, Sherry. Uh, with regard to solar energy and using PV panels, the challenge um, this uh, question asks us, ask or says is the lifetime of batteries for storage. Are there more affordable options to resolve this, uh, this need? Um, could you speak a bit about the affordable options for storage, Sherry? Yeah, and it, again, sort of depends on your exact context. Um, higher capex, um, perhaps lower lifetime opex would be something like pumped um, you know, pumped hydro, pumped hydro storage, um, where you're, you know, basically pumping water up, and then when you need it, you're letting it run down and run a turbine. Um, very high capex, but the overall lifespan of those systems is a, is a much longer lifespan. And so, if you look at your total levelized cost of energy, in certain circumstances, is is lower than batteries. Um, you know, and lithium ion batteries are amazing, and the costs are definitely coming down. But there are other battery chemistries as well that are cheaper. Um, you know, using float batteries, using flooded batteries um, that have been used, you know, worldwide in microgrids for years. Um, those are cheaper options in terms of the capex today. Um, you know, in a few years, I think lithium will probably take over that. Um, but you know, if you need to go that direction for sort of a, a stopgap measure for the next few years, those types of batteries, your standard lead acids, um, tend to still be cheaper in a lot of places, not everywhere. Um, so there are some other options. We see flywheels in some places, but those tend to be harder to maintain and operate. Um, James, it looks like you want to jump in too, so go ahead. I was just going to hop onto the lead acid lithium ion conversation uh, discussion that you were having with yourself. Uh, make it a discussion by hopping in. Uh, <laughs> jump in. But we worked, um, yeah, uh, it's something you see, especially in hot and humid climates. You know, I, did, I worked on a project uh, with a microgrid developer in uh, Tanzania in Africa, and they were using lead acid batteries and getting like a three year lifetime out of them just because of the harsh conditions. And so we kind of analyzed it, even though you know lithium ion batteries had a higher upfront cost, we looked at a lifetime cost and it made sense for them to kind of make the decision to, even though it cost twice as much upfront to actually, you know, go to that and um, see, hopefully see some lifetime benefits in some in a battery that they hoped could last 10 years. Uh, so that's, you know, considerations like that, looking at the lifetime uh, lifetime cost implications of different batteries specifically or storage choices in general. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
All right, thank you. There is another question in the chat. It's a detailed one. I see that Sherry Stout is replying to the post. So rather than um, take up more time, um, let us go to our closing poll. James, did you want to, to throw that up while, while Sherry types out an answer to, to Mark? Sure, yes, I can. And I'll put the link back in the chat here uh, or in the question and answer pane. So on Teams in there it is. All right, so it should be in the question and answer. You can click on the uh, the link to head over to the polls. I will share the screen. I'll start by showing uh, all the results that came in for the question I asked. Uh, I asked before we got into all of the presentations. So there we go. Um, just to show you the results of this, because a lot of some more came in uh, as we were doing the presentations. As I, I left it live, but in, in order of importance for generation. Uh, we've got clean renewable energy, energy independence, independence and resilience uh, making the top three, which I think uh, were some good lessons from the webinar today and shows that uh, that at least our attendees of this webinar are making other considerations other than just upfront costs. Uh, so the last, uh, so these last questions we'll go to here um, are uh, it's more of a feedback survey, and it's something that uh, a sponsor of our webinar really likes to get uh, a sense of who attended and what kind of impact uh, or they're reaching in these webinars. So um, yeah, go to this link that's in the chat. It's poll. Oh, it's not showing on the screen here, but it's basically this pollev.com uh, slash lcrow118 if you're looking at the screen and trying to get it. So um, and it starts with, yep, just please enter your name. And we'll get some brief background information. Um, next question, the results here will not show on the screen, but uh, what is your gender? Uh, next question, country of residence. We actually have, we can skip this one. We've got it from earlier in the uh, earlier in the webinar, or if you or feel free to enter them. I see some results coming in here or some answers coming in, so feel free to enter it. Um, we'll go through these quickly. Uh, and then profession, job title, and organization. And again, if you're just hopping on, there is a link to this to this poll in the Teams live Q and A pane. All right, so just out of these, which sector do you work in? If it's a government, academia, project finance, project development, non-governmental organization or other. All right, thank you. Thank you again, everyone for uh, participating in these. Uh, please rate, so in feedback, please rate how well this webinar has improved your knowledge and understanding of the importance of assessing climate vulnerabilities in power sector planning. So how, how well has this increased your knowledge? Going from five meaning very well to one meaning not well. Open-ended question then. How do you plan to use this information learned in this webinar for your work? And again, really do appreciate all of your uh, responses and feedback for this. It'll help um, help get a sense of uh, the impact that these webinars are having and also how we can uh, direct you know, direct these future sessions uh, towards what um, you know what you and the audience uh, need or want to hear most about. So I'll leave this one up for a little longer and give you a chance to uh, to type in the answers, but how do you plan to use the information learned in this webinar for your work? And of course, if you, if you do have any other feedback that you want us to capture, or if you don't get time to get your feedback in during these polls while they're open, uh, you can please feel free to reach out and uh, and send that to us. We had our contact information on uh, on the slides, or you can get it from our from our friends at Sikri. 
Guys, next question: What did you like about this webinar? Just uh, you can put a one or two or a couple things that you that you did like particularly about the webinar. And again, thank you. Really appreciate all of your time and thoughts and feedback for all of this. All right, and I believe there's just I just view one more, although some results are still coming in. So give you ten more seconds. All right, then the last question. Uh, what, if anything, would you suggest the organizers change about the webinar? So what areas would you like to see uh, improvements or uh, directing to most need most meet uh, what you'd like to see out of out of webinars in the future. All right, and as I leave as I leave this last one up for a little while longer, I'll say that again, thank you. Really appreciate all your responses and feedback for this, and for uh, tuning in throughout the throughout this uh, session for asking good questions um, and apparently staying engaged. I guess and, uh, thanks to all the other uh, speakers too, and to uh, Sikri for hosting this webinar, and uh, to USAID. Thank you. Thank you, James, and then and, and let me echo the thanks to the USAID, to NREL, to ICF, uh, to CIMH, who is our longstanding partner, um, to GIZ, who, who funds a lot of our IRP work, and thank you to the audience who was very engaged. We had a very active um, chat session, um, lots of Q&A. Mark, especially, the, the last question you asked, I wish we'd had the time to discuss it more, but Sherry is giving you a lot of information in there. Hope you're, you're reading it. Um, it's clear that there's more discussion to be had on this, and we at Secre are open for that discussion. So if you need to, to reach us, either write to resilience, R-I-S-I-L-I-E-N-C-E, -E, at uh, secre.org, that's two Cs, one R, three E's, and you can get in touch with us to, to talk a bit more about uh, resilience. If you have a more general inquiry, just write to info at secre.org or visit secre.org slash IRRP for more information on our integrated resource and resilience planning program. Um, once again, I'm Gerald Lindo. Uh, we are the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, and we're glad that you took the time to be with us today. Please be on the lookout for more events in this series. We are here to help build the capacity right across the region for integrated resource and resilience planning and in the technologies and approaches that we need to make this energy transition happen so we can improve the lives of Caribbean people. Thank you once again to everybody. Uh, have a good day and we'll see you again soon.